few months ago, I received a mysterious email from Sarah and friends recommending that I read the book Beautiful Disaster. I knew nothing about this book. The email said to go in blinds because spoiling it would be like saying Santa's not real to a child. But obviously I had to investigate and it led me where it always leads me back to my wall. Hello and welcome to another video of me exhaustively recapping and slandering books that feel almost too ridiculous to be real. Using the aid of a wall of mostly royalty-free stock photos, except for also this one picture of Dylan Sprouse. Nobody say anything about that one, okay? Great. Beautiful Disaster is a romance novel that was self-published in 2011 by Jamie McGuire. Very, very loosely, this book is about a good girl with a dark past who ends up losing a bet to this emotionally dysregulated bad boy, and then she has to live with him for a month. In every way imaginable, this book feels like a relic of its time. The 2011 is dripping off of every page to the point where reading it felt like paying my respects to the Wattpad garbage of yore. But more on that soon. Back to book lore. After this became a smash hit, the author Jamie was picked up by a publisher and went on to write five more books and two more novellas all in this same universe. The only other book in this set that saw even a fraction of the same success as the original was called Walking Disaster and it's literally just beautiful disaster but again from the perspective of the other main character. And also somehow even more incoherent than the original. But people really did eat that up at the time. But after slowly fading into irrelevancy, Jamie came back in a big way when, for reasons truly beyond my comprehension, instead of just letting this die, Beautiful Disaster was picked back up from the pits of hell and made into a B-movie starring, of all people, Dylan Sprouse. Because this is what you think about when you imagine a motorcycle riding tattooed bad boy who also happens to be a prodigy mixed martial artist. You think to yourself, yeah cast a Sprouse brother. <laughs> and I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through this book, that Dylan Sprouse really took this role. He really decided to do this movie. So that's the background. This book was incredibly popular at a time before I was like truly sentient as a person on this planet. And experiencing it now as an adult woman in the year of our Lord 2024, it, it feels like the seed, the root of everything that was to come within the next decade. And today in this video, I'm going to be running you through all of the nonsense that happens in this book that made it that way. There's an underground fight club. There's rampant early 2000s misogyny. There's what I truly do believe to be a fictional representation of the Italian mafia, although like with many things in this book, it's not completely clear. And hopefully through all of it, you will start to see why I believe that this book was a harbinger of things to come. The unassuming seed of every terrible Netflix adaptation of something off of Wattpad. But before we begin, I have a couple of disclaimers. First of all, the author of this book, Jamie McGuire, I have learned while researching for this video is allegedly a pretty bad person. She allegedly seems to be this pretty cool cocktail of racism racist, anti-vax, and just generally a haver of some pretty bad takes that she shares on Facebook of all places. None of this should have been surprising to me considering that I really do feel like only someone who allegedly is a white supremacist could have come up with the name Shepley for a character that we're supposed to like. Out of her own free will, no less, she could have named him anything and she chose to invent garbage, but Fortunately, for anybody who's concerned about whether to separate the art from the artist in this instance, I can assure you that in this case, you do not have to. They both suck. Allegedly. Rachel did a really good video on her that I'll link in my description if you want to see more detail on her bad takes. But all of this is to say that I am going to tell you everything that you need to know about this book. All of your wildest dreams are inside of this video. You can consider this to be fairly exhaustive, but if for some reason, like I know some of you do, you're a masochist and you feel inspired to read this book after this, this is me telling you to get it from the library. Okay? Okay. Secondly, this is my quarterly disclaimer that me making fun of a romance book does not mean I hate women. You should consider this to be a defense of women, actually because we deserve to have silly goofy romance novels that don't also rot out our brains from the inside. I am going to be slandering this book because it deserves it and because it's funny and if that's going to bother you then you should go somewhere else. You should look after your own happiness. And finally with that if you loved this for some reason especially if you read it 10 years ago but even now in the modern day it's okay to enjoy things okay not everything has to be that serious. I still see you as a complete person I just probably wouldn't take your book recommendations. Before we get into the meat of this let me set the scene. I want to introduce you to the main people I feel like you need to know. The protagonist of this book is named Abby Abernathy and that sounds even worse out loud than it did written down but if you think her name is bad then her personality manages to be miraculously even worse than that. Her main traits inside of this book include being insufferable, knowing lots of math, and thinking that all other women other than her and her best friend they're all sluts. The whole book is from her perspective and being inside of her brain for 400 pages is a prison that I would not have wished on my worst enemy. Next Travis is her love interest and you're gonna learn everything that you need 
need to know about Travis as we go through this together. It's truly too good to spoil here, but for now just think of him as like the platonic ideal of a brooding Wattpad bad boy. Except also, once again, he's canonically a Sprouse brother now, which really adds to his entire flavor. You'll see. The two other main characters are Abby's best friend America and Travis's cousin slash roommate slash best friend whose name is Shepley. As an experiment, just for fun, I asked ChatGPT to generate some baby names that don't actually exist that are inspired by the names of old money rich white people and the list I got was Drayton, Thornley, Wycliffe, Pembroke, and Ellsworth. It's almost inspiring how well Shepley fits into that list considering the fact that this was written in a prehistoric era. This was a time before AI could help you figure out which vineyard vinesified white boy name to give your beta male side character. That's true creativity coming from the author. Shepley has almost no discernible personality traits other than being kind of annoying, neurotic, and a man. And America is not as obviously awful as Abby, but what she lacks in insufferability she makes up for with what you will see is just a reckless disregard for the health and the safety of her alleged best friend. This woman does not care if Abby lives or dies for like 90% of this book. It's truly a sight to behold. I think that we're meant to like all four of these characters, but instead they all suck in their own fun and fantastic ways. Setting the scene, all of these people are in college together. Shepley, America, Abby, they're all freshmen. They're maybe like a month or so into their first year. And then Travis is a sophomore because he's older and therefore edgier and more mysterious. The university that they attend only has one on-page adult this entire book. It kind of just functions like a lawless land. Nothing that happens at this college will make any sense. Like there are never any consequences for any of the public debauchery that is constantly occurring. Like the mob has a bigger presence in this book than campus police. And you just kind of have to accept that for the jump. But with that in mind, the scene is set. That's everything you really need to know before we dive in. But before we do that, real quick, I have a word from a very exciting sponsor for today's video. Hi, it's me from the past. And I would like to take a minute to talk about the sponsor for today's video, which is Notion. I have been a loyal Notion user for about two and a half years. And it's a really hard program to describe, mostly because it's completely what you make of it. So what I'm about to show you is how I use Notion. But as a productivity platform, your mileage may vary. Like a lot of people use it for pretty serious stuff. They collaborate, they work on business, they take notes for med school. And you can do all of those very important and very serious things, or you can be like me and just use it to keep all of your silly little hobbies together. Okay, so this is the homepage of my Notion, and it's a good place to talk about what Notion like actually is, because you probably have no idea at this point in the ad, but I'm hoping that it rapidly becomes more clear as you see more and more of my pages. But at its core, Notion is just a collection of blank pages and then different elements that you can move around as much as you want on a page. And once you've put together all of the elements that you want and you've created a page, you can nest other pages inside of that first page in order to make a little tree of like everything that you have going on in your life. Like that was my hub. And this is one example where I have about a million other links because I'm not joking. Like I do in fact use this for everything. Now my notion is completely Frankenstein together using a variety of different templates as well as a lot of things that I just created myself over time. And I wish that I remembered where I got all of these free resources from so I could share them with you, but I never expected my notion to see the cold light of day. Okay. You'll have to forgive me for not having everything on record, but the page that I made almost completely from scratch and also the page that you're probably most curious about is my book page. So this is my very cute exterior where I have it set to show me all of my TBR books for the month, as well as some stats for the years, some links to some other relevant things in my life. But mostly this is just a home for my book hub, which is an example of the second reason that Notion slaps in my opinion, which is the ability to create and link together these pretty complicated databases. This is the central location where I have every single book that I own, as well as some random information about all of these different books. But Notion makes it really easy and really satisfying to keep this list together because I can also filter it by like a million different things. Like here is every mystery that I own. Here is every book that I've ever given five stars. Apparently I've only read 49.266% of the books I own, which is embarrassing, but Notion lets me stay up to date on that. And this database also connects through this right here to automatically keep track of how many pages and books that I've read per year. Nobody mentioned how March is kind of struggling right now, okay? This is how it goes when I make videos like this. My brain just kind of turns into jello. But thanks to Notion, I can see evidence of my reading slump visually, which is pretty cool. But I have pages for other things too. Let me show you a couple of them. I made one for the 2022 Oscars. I watched like 95% of the movies that were nominated that year. I meant to do it for this year, but I got really busy and then kind of watched nothing instead. It really goes to show how I commit to things. I don't cook like ever really, but I have this spread where I've taken all of like the recipes I've ever gotten in my email inbox. So that way one day when I do become a chef, I just have a ton of different recipes that all look really good. I've taken exhaustive notes on every season of Survivor for essentially no reason. I don't want to compete on Survivor ever or starve on TV. I'm kind of just like this. And I also plan all of my content on Notion, like the script for the YouTube video that you're watching that was on here before it was where you are right now on your screen. There is not a thing that I don't do on this platform. Every hyper fixation I've ever had lives and dies on its own Notion subpage. And I could keep going, but I'm 
only supposed to be doing this for two minutes. So <laughs> the point is, I am the biggest Notion fan that there's ever been. And yes, they are paying me to say that, but if you watch my videos, you know that I have before said that for free. And something else I do for free is use Notion because it's a completely free program. Everything that I've showed you today, all that it's cost me is my time and also my dignity working for that long on my silly little databases. So I beg of you to give Notion a try. If you're a student, if you're a control freak, if you're a spreadsheet warrior, if you're doing anything that feels kind of overwhelming and would benefit from even a modicum of organization. If you are a person with a pulse, I bet that it would work for you. And like, yes, I'm biased, but I'm also right. So I strongly recommend checking it out. You can sign up for free through the link in my description. And thank you to Notion for sponsoring this video. I'm in love with you. Marriage isn't off the table. Okay, off I go, back to it. All right, let's do this. We're first introduced to Abby and her cool life and her cool friends when she enters the basement of a random academic building at midnight. And she is there alongside Shepley and America to watch the latest fight inside of the secret society fight club that her college has, which is led by this guy named Adam. Welcome to the bloodbath. If you are looking for economics 101, you're in the wrong place, my friend. If you seek the circle, this is Mecca. My name is Adam. I make the rules and I call the fight. Betting ends once the opponents are on the floor. No touching the fighters, no assistance, no bet switching, and no encroachment of the ring. If you break these rules, you will get the piss beat out of you and you will be thrown out on your ass without your money. That includes you, ladies. So don't use your ass to scam the system, boys. Now, Adam apparently created the circle around three years before the start of this book, and other than that, we will never learn anything meaningful about this man. And that's tragic because I have so many questions. Like, how do you end up doing something like this as a student? Is he even a student? Is he a grimy middle-aged man? Is he a part of the mob? Do their connections in the rest of this book run this deep? Or like logistically with just running the fight club that as you will learn only has fights on school property. How do you find locations for that? How do none of these buildings ever have cameras? How does he find people to fight? How has nobody in the surrounding community questioned where all of these apparently star athletes are just getting beaten up like half to death on the regular all of the time? Because all of them are apparently inside of this fight club and I just nobody cares that they're all injured constantly because of prize fighting I guess. These are just some of the questions I had reading this book. And the answer to all of them just seems to be, it's Fight Club, don't worry about it, it's Fight Club. So I guess it just works out because the information we do get, how this works apparently is, the fights are only planned out one hour in advance, which is when Adam texts the inner circle the location. And then it's kind of like a multi-level marketing sort of thing because the inner circle texts the next level of people who text the people after that until everybody knows what's up. And they all go to this randomized campus location at midnight to drink copious amounts of alcohol and watch as Travis, who is apparently the best fighter there's ever been or will be. All of these people watch and they cheer and they pray for his downfall as Travis pulls up and almost kills someone for sport in the basement of the science building. That's the backdrop for a significant portion of this book. Our next fighter doesn't need an introduction, but because he scares the shit out of me, I'll give him one anyway. Shake in your boots, boys, and drop your panties, ladies. I give you Travis Mad Dog Maddox. So that's what Abby walks into at the beginning of this book, and she's only there because ever since freshman orientation, America, childhood best friend, has been dating Shepley. And Shepley obviously goes to Fight Club constantly to support Travis, but this is the first time that they've brought Abby. We learned through them that Travis debuted at Fight Club last year, and again, he's just the best there's ever been. I guess there's no comparison. Apparently, he only gets hit sometimes on his terms to make the fights, like, look fair, so that way people still bet on him to lose. He's just that good. We're talking, like, child MMA prodigy meets the Matrix in terms of his abilities, and he proves them immediately by dunking on the star of the wrestling team. And Abby should really not be watching this. In fact, she apparently made a promise when she went to college that she would not get involved in anything remotely seedy or criminal due to her tortured past. We'll learn about this later. But obviously her self-respect, her mental fortitude, her ability to stick on the path of her goals and ambitions, it's just, it's not that serious, I guess, because she has reneged on this promise to herself within weeks of college. And that's all because of America, by the way, who knows very well what Abby's entire plan is and why she is the way that she is, but just decides to be a bad influence and drag her into an illegal fight club anyways, just for fun. There's no actual reason. That's the kind of person that America is. And this is just number one on a long list of reasons why America is the woke, the worst friend to ever do it. More on that soon. Anyways, Abby is watching this fight and she's so invested in watching Travis beat this guy's ass that she starts to push through the crowd to the front by the ring. So that way she can have a better view because she's small and breakable with the short stubby legs of a lady. She can't see from all the way back there. And by the time she gets to the front, Travis like breaks this wrestler's nose into her. Haha. 
Ah, meet cute, which drenches her in blood, ruins, by the way, her bright pink cardigan, symbolic of innocence and childlike wonder, that's gone, which really is her own fault because you don't walk into the splash zone like that in clothing that's dry clean only. My eyes traveled upward, jeans spattered with blood, a set of finely chiseled abs, a bare tattooed chest drenched in sweat, and finally a pair of warm brown eyes. I was shoved from behind and Travis caught me by the arm before I fell forward. Hey, back up off her. Sorry about that, pigeon. Pigeon. Yeah, knowing nothing about this woman, just profiling her based on her blank-eyed stare and her bloodied cardigan, Travis affectionately comes up with the nickname Pigeon. And this is all that this man will be calling her this entire book, except actually it gets even worse than that because sometimes he will shorten it to Pidge. Just another nickname for an already awful nickname. Very cool. Just more proof, if you need it, that we live in a dystopian world. But immediately after this fun meet cute, Travis ends up getting swallowed up into the crowd. He just fades within seconds into the masses of people, leaving Abby on her own. And America finally, at this point, finds Abby and kind of wags her finger at her a little bit, like, I can't believe that someone as small and little and lady as you went off into the splash zone on your own. That's incredibly dangerous. <laughs> just kidding. It's what I love about you, that you do stupid shit and make Maybe it'll get you killed. Yeah, that's America. But the two of them walk back to their dorm and they're not roommates. Actually, they don't live together because Abby wanted to branch out in college and instead decided to randomly room with this girl named Kara. And Kara is maybe the only sane person inside of this entire book. Like this woman is just trying to exist and study a normal amount and not walk into traffic before graduation. But Abby and America, for reasons completely unclear to us, hate her and they will constantly put her through the most infuriating things imaginable through the rest of this book. America followed me into my dorm room and then sneered at my roommate, Kara. I immediately peeled off the bloody cardigan, throwing it into the hamper. Gross. Where have you been? Kara asked from her bed. And America tries unsuccessfully to pass this off as just being like a really bad nosebleed. But me personally, I think if my roommate who treated me like garbage showed up covered in blood and then made it my problem, I think then maybe I would switch rooms. I would talk to my RA, not that this college has RAs, they don't have any authority figures, but I would not be living there anymore if that were me. This is just Kara's first mistake. Already ground zero for this book, but this will get worse for her. And also I just wanna say that No Thoughts Head Empty, just throwing the unwashed bloody cardigan into the hamper is psychopathic behavior. What are you doing? Are you just gonna like let it dry with all of your other clothes? You ruined the entire bin with the blood of a stranger. <laughs> like whatever. Anyways, the next day we go from setting one fight club to setting two school lunch because one thing about every trashy romance book that takes place on a college campus is everybody eats lunch every single day inside of one central cafeteria all the time. None of these college students are out here consuming three half microwave taquitos over their sink in between classes like real red-blooded American undergraduates. It's always high school part two and never the true and honest depths of degeneracy that most of us will experience in our lifetimes. But that's just how it goes in the world of beautiful disaster. Everybody eats lunch together inside of the cafeteria and talks about their feelings. And in this instance, Abby pulls up and she sits with Shepley in America. And even though presumably this is who she's been sitting with all year, this is her only friend. And Travis also seems to have no friends other than Shepley. This is only the first time that these two are meeting each other in the wild. America and I both turn to see Travis take a seat at the end of the table. He was followed by two voluptuous bottle blondes wearing Sigma Kappa tees. One of them sat on Travis's lap. The other sat beside him, pawing at his shirt. <laughs> and here we get an important character trait of Travis because he has an unlimited amount of women who are just hanging off of him at all times, at all hours of the day. Wake, sleep, lunchtime, fight club, in class. He's got bitches for every occasion. This man is sincerely implied to have banged half of the college campus, except he only has one night stands as a rule. All of these women are disposable to him. He doesn't want anything serious and also barely sees them as people. These are important things to understand about Travis's psychology. And in Abby's head, 100% of these women, which are all women that she sees in this entire book other than America, they're all just stupid to her, every single one of them. It doesn't matter that she was frothing at the mouth over this man's bare chest not 24 hours ago. Abby would never sink to such a level as enjoying a one night stand. She's not like those other girls. She's too moral and virgin and lady and upright for such a thing. Travis ends up shooing away these girls and Shepley starts immediately like writhing in agony on top of this table because he can just tell that Travis wants 
to smash. And that can't be if Shepley has anything to say about it because apparently he's been hurt before. This isn't my first rodeo mare. Cool animal nickname, just another one thrown in by the way. Do you know how many times he screwed things up for me because he one night's the best friend? All of a sudden it's a conflict of interest to date me because it's fraternizing with the enemy. I'm telling you, Abby, he looked at me. Don't tell Mayor she can't come over or date me because you fall for Trav's line of BS. Consider yourself warned. This will be his only personality trait from now on. This is literally the only conflicts that Shepley will have inside of this book. It's just him looking around at his surroundings and then kind of scrunching his face up and going, don't sleep with him or I'll, I'll roll around on my floor and cry and it'll be your fault. <laughs> Travis and Abby banter a bit during lunch. She's like, don't call me Pigeon, I have a name. And he's like, what's your name? Because I guess he doesn't know. This is the first time that they've actually met. And then she just refuses to tell him. So he continues calling her Pigeon, which you can't have it both ways like that, but whatever. After lunch, we discover that Travis happens to be in a bunch of her classes, but Abby has never seen him until now because he has been flanked at all times by too many of his single use homes. But this time he changes seats and he sits in the back of the classroom with Abby because he's intrigued by her. He wants to figure her out. He wants to be able to like, name a woman before he dies, maybe. He sees her as a worthy potential conduit for that. So they banter a little bit more and she just decides to get ahead of it on page 10. I'm not sleeping with you. You should give up now. A slow smile crept across his face before he spoke. I haven't asked you to sleep with me. His eyes drifted to the ceiling and thought, have I? I'm not a Barbie twin or one of your little groupies up there. I said, glancing at the girls behind us. I'm not impressed with your tattoos or your boyish charm or your forced indifference. So you can stop the antics, okay? Travis responds to this by being like, okay, no big deal. But also how about you come over tonight to the apartment that I share with my beloved cousin Shepley and then I have no ulterior motives at all. Not a single ulterior motive or reason to have you there, maybe. How about that? And Abby really testing the limits of her glass-like will. She's just like, I'll think about it. A residual smile lingered on his face, making the dimple in his cheek sink in. The more he smiled, the more I wanted to hate him. And yet, it was the very thing that made hating him impossible. Just already down bad in the way that only a girl who is completely unimpressed with his boyish charm and tattoos and forced indifference could possibly be. It's so early and you can already tell that this book is going straight to hell. Like no stop express train. But before they can keep talking and continue their descent, the professor for their class comes in. And this is the only adult that you will see at this entire university, all book. And he opens his lecture for this unknown, barely described, irrelevant history class by saying, who can can tell me which president had a cross-eyed wife with a bad case of the uglies. 2011 was a different time. Or maybe not. Maybe not. As the day goes on, Travis keeps following this woman around because that's how you make friends with someone who is hell-bent on ignoring you. You just be hot, you have tattoo, and you stalk. And true to form, eventually Abby is like, if I say yes to coming over tonight, will you leave me alone? And he's like, yeah, that sounds good. See you soon, Pidge. And then he just scampers off. So she's locked in, I guess. Abby goes back to her dorm and outside of the building, she runs into America and then also Finch, who she describes as being the third in their trio, but this is a blatant lie. This man is completely irrelevant to this book. He's only in like five total scenes and all of them have to have at least one line about how he's flamboyantly gay because that is his only meaningful personality trait. And we will be reminded of it because look how progressive this book is to have a bunch of white characters except one of them is gay and likes men and likes dating men and you know, not girls, isn't that crazy? Finch also has bleached blonde hair that is described in the book to be shaped like a spike, which is a description I took some creative liberty with when I did his picture. So I hope you understand. Anyways, the three of them talk for a bit about recent events. Finch is like, Travis, Geez, Abby, when did you start fishing in the deep end? And America basically calls Abby a tease for agreeing to go over to his house with no intention of sleeping with him. She's like, it would save time for you if you just got it out of the way and you did it now, which is an insane thing to say. Like Travis beats people up as his job. And America, who's in his apartment all of the time with her boyfriend, Shepley, she witnesses the constant stream of heartbroken women who populate his domain after he throws them away like trash. And she's like, what's the worst that could happen? Just sleep with him. Just have a good time. Like you hate her. That's your best friend. Or perhaps even worse, you were truly just the dumbest woman imaginable. It's like the one girl that Abby is not misogynistic towards inside of this book. She's the worst of them all. The call is coming from inside the house. Anyways, Abby changes to prepare for their fun evening together as a gang. And she decides to go with the strategy of wearing pajamas, 
glasses and a messy bun to look as unattractive as possible, which felt a little bit offensive to me considering that's most of what I wear, but we'll move on from that. It's just the classic. Like she's thinking to herself, if I dress ugly, then he'll think I'm ugly and he'll stay away from me. As if that matters at all. It doesn't, just gonna put that out there. We've learned that since 2011, but they leave and America sees her for the first time and hits her with, yuck, Abby, you look homeless. Good, I said. <laughs> and they pull up to Travis's apartment. Everyone talks. Travis is like, I like you with no makeup on, this au natural thing. And Abby internally is like, darn, foiled again. <laughs> but we learned during this conversation that Travis is also the smartest man alive. He can do no wrong. He gets straight A's in all of his classes with essentially no effort and still has the time to beat the shit out of people on the side, which we also learned he gets paid quite a lot of money to do. It's how Shepley and Travis have this nice apartment. And Abby says to him, she's like, why not just get a different job? And he's like, I don't need to. I'm literally the best to ever do it. And I mean, I guess if you had the superhuman abilities that Travis is described to have inside of this book and you were cool with using them for evil, I guess that it would kind of be free money. So good for him for realizing that. But Travis ends up dragging Abby out to get dinner, just the two of them, because neither of them have eaten yet. And also America just wants to watch the world burn, I guess. And how do they get there? How do they find their way to this diner? What vehicle could they possibly drive? Obviously it's a motorcycle. A man like Travis would never let an artificial barrier get between his deep thirst for freedom and the open road. Oh, get on. I'll go slow. What is that? I asked, reading the writing on the gas tank too late. It's a Harley night rod. She's the love of my life, so don't scratch the paint when you get on. She gets on. Travis goes, there's nothing to hold on to but me, Pidge, as if he's known her for longer than 18 hours. And they go and eat food at some random diner. And this whole meal, the entire soccer team happens to also be at the same diner. And they're just pointing and laughing at Travis. Because apparently this is the first woman that Travis has ever been seen taking out to dinner. And they're like, like, wow, he's lost his touch, what a loser, which is among the less realistic things that people do in this book, considering the simple facts that Travis has proven himself capable of such violence that they all get together and watch it for sport. But now they're like, yeah, let's just point and laugh at that guy, you know, and just see what happens. But fortunately for all of their livelihoods, even though he probably could, Travis decides to hold back. He refrains from 20v1ing and just taking them all out. He's with a lady, okay? He has different priorities. He's only just now learning that maybe women are people. And in this scene, right towards the beginning, of the book, we really learn all that there is to know about Travis. Functionally, all of his lore is just dropped on us all at once because Abby asks him, she's like, who are you? Where did you come from? How did you get here? How did you end up the person that you are? And he goes, yeah, I grew up here in this city and my dad was an alcoholic and my mom was like super dead. So my four older brothers would just all take turns beating me up every single day when I was growing up. I learned to fight back though, you know, like they made me who I am. And I've actually never done any training other than that because that's how much I got beaten up when I was growing up. It just, you know, it made me into the most competent fighter that the world has ever seen. Oh, and by the way, my family now is awesome. Like dad quit drinking and all of my brothers are cool now. We're just best friends and nobody has any problems ever, which is just a lot to take in. You know, that's quite the transition. Also worth noting here that all of his brothers have names that start with T. He's from one of those families, which I really do feel is an underrated contributor to this man's internalized trauma. But more on that later. The last thing that we learn about him during this conversation is that he's a criminal justice major, which is also rich considering the fact that he is simultaneously a prize fighter, but you know, cognitive dissonance comes for us all. But yeah, that's basically his entire backstory. It's just given to us up front, which I find honestly kind of refreshing. Like he's a simple man. All of his actions for the rest of this book, for better or for worse, have pretty obvious cause and effect. The real mystery inside of this book is what the deal with Abby is, which we learn nothing about during this conversation. He does ask her some questions, but she just deftly avoids them all with the scale of an acrobat. So nothing there is learned or gains from this, but even still, after this meal, it's pretty evident that the two of them have become friends. After that, we fast forward into the next day, both in the book and also in person with me, and everybody's eating lunch together again in the cafeteria of communion, except the only relevant thing this time is that there's this guy named Brazil who sits across from Abby. And this is, by the way, I'm pretty sure the only brown person in this entire book. I just want to put that out there. And his name is Brazil. But Brazil is there because he's friends with Shepley. They're in the same fraternity, Sigma Tau, alongside seemingly every college-aged male inside of this book, including Travis. They're all in this fraternity together and he's just minding his own business when Travis walks in and he kicks him out of his seat so that way he can sit next to Abby. That's just how friends they already are. They're so friends. And at least one in every two conversations inside of the first half of this book has to somehow reference how Abby would never sleep with Travis, that dirty dog, that wily weasel. So they have to go through that rigmarole once again as if it wasn't done five pages ago until the topic changes to how Abby has a biology exam later that day. And Abby is this winning combination of lazy and also easily intimidated. Like she's given up on this test before even beginning 
something to study. She's like, I don't really care. I'm never going to understand it, so why even try? And Travis ends up offering to tutor her, and by offer, I mean that he once again just will not take no for an answer. But at least this time, it's kind of for a good cause. Like, this is, I guess, a nice thing for him to do. So they end up going into a room and just grinding a little bit. He, like, teaches her some mnemonic devices, and because of this session, she gets to the point where she feels mostly okay about the test. You're not gonna be mad if I flunk this test, are you? You're not going to flunk, Pidge. We need to start earlier for the next one, though, he said, keeping in step with me to the science building. How are you going to tutor me, do your homework, study, and train for your fights? Travis chuckled. I don't train for my fights. Just a hilarious juxtaposition here between the two primary settings of this book, and also important in Lord. I feel like it's crucial to understand that, at least on page, Travis never goes to the gym. He doesn't train. He doesn't do shit, but he still ends up being the best that there ever was, with also an infinite amount of time to tutor Abby through every single class that she has, because that's just the kind of guy that he is. Wow. After this experience, when America finds out about this, she ends up teasing Abby, like, if just tutor, why sexy? If just tutor, why look at you like that? not just tutor. Except also, apparently, we learned that this is all just one stepping stone inside of America's master plan. It had always been a dream of America's for us to date friends, and roommates slash cousins for her was hitting the jackpot. Apparently, she's been trying to find a friend of Shepley's for Abby to date their entire college experience so far. So she is eating this up, and it really explains a lot about this woman that her number one priority, again, above the health and safety of her best friend, is ensuring that she has the ability to go on double dates. But whatever, after this point, Travis keeps tutoring her, they keep hanging out, and the gossip mill of their university is very confused on how to handle this new situation. Because Travis isn't just ghosting her completely after one singular day of hanging out. So the assumption is that they must just not be banging because he's actually treating this woman like a human being instead of like a single-use plastic bag. So most of the campus is buying that they're actually just friends. But at this point, we meet Parker, who is a classmate of Abby's and also a fraternity brother at Sigma Tau, like every other man in this book. And Parker starts off this book on his hero's journey very nice nice, extremely rich, and way too okay with the threat of being cucked. More on that soon, we'll get there. But those are his three main personality traits. And for now, he just looks at Abby with his big green eyes and his striped polo. And he's like, you're cute and fun in class. You should come to this party that my fraternity's throwing. And Abby's a fan. She loves his vibe. She thinks he's cute. She's very excited. So she agrees to go. And witness to this entire encounter is Finch, a rare Finch scene inside of this book. He's cute, huh? I asked, unable to stop smiling. Hell yes, in that preppy, missionary position kind of way. So true, King. Thank you for that. Finch also delivers the wisdom that apparently the hot water inside of Abby's dorm is broken, which she also hears from Kara as soon as she goes up to her room. And at this point, America also barges in and she says, can you believe this? How much are we paying and we can't even take a hot shower? Kara sighed. Stop whining. Why don't you just stay with your boyfriend? Haven't you been staying with him anyway? America's eyes darted in Kara's direction. Good idea, Kara. The fact that you're a total bitch comes in handy sometimes. And within the span of about 15 seconds in two texts, America makes the plan for her and Abby to sleep over at Travis and Shepley's apartment until the water is back on. And does America ask for Abby's opinion? Does she think about the possible repercussions of this? Does she consider where Abby might be sleeping? Absolutely not. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not a terrible idea. You know, Abby can just sleep on the couch and it'll be completely fine. Except apparently, Travis has an unlimited number of one night stands, right? It's kind of his thing. Except apparently, there has never been a girl inside of his bed. 100% of this man's one night stands are on the couch inside of the common room of his apartment because to take a woman to bed is too serious for a man such as him. He would never do it. And Abby doesn't know this, but surely America does. She sleeps there all of the time and the walls inside of this apartment, we will soon learn, are incredibly thin. She knows what happens on this couch, but because she is evil, there is just a darkness inside of this woman, apparently. She's probably scheming and thinking to herself, well, Abby is not gonna wanna sleep on the couch once we get there. You know, she'll ends up having to sleep inside of his bed. And I wonder what will happen then. Oh, guess we'll have to find out. Like, I will not believe for a second that this entire thing was not a part of her plot. I would not put it past America to have knocked out the hot water herself, but Abby knows none of this, obviously, so she just agrees. She's like, sure, good, whatever. The two of them are mean to Kara a couple more times, and then America's like, you should pack for several days, because who's to say how long it'll take for things to get better back here? And then they leave. And when they get there, there's a woman inside of the apartment who's buttoning up her blouse 
house after what I can only imagine was a wonderful night on the couch. And despite her efforts to give Travis her number, he just disposes of her instantly and tells her to go. And America just looks at this woman and goes, every time, America said, she looked at the woman. How are you surprised by this? He's Travis Maddox. He's famous for this very thing. And every time they're surprised. Just a really cool description of the man that she is willing to do nefarious things to set up with her best friend, but whatever. Anyways, she's extremely flustered by this for some reason, so she just runs off to Shepley's room, ditching Abby completely in this situation. This random woman storms out of the apartment, and then Travis just starts making lunch, as if nothing happened. I collapsed against the recliner and sighed, wondering if I was crazy for agreeing to come. I didn't realize Shepley's apartment was a revolving door for clueless bimbos. And if you think that's tough, Travis's opinions on these women are somehow even worse because Abby like halfway comes to this girl's defense and she's like, you know, that girl seems pretty upset. It's kind of a wacky thing to do to someone. Why would you sleep with her if you're not going to call her? I don't promise anyone anything, Pidge. She didn't stipulate a relationship before she sold on my couch. I stared at the couch with revulsion. She's someone's daughter, Travis. What if down the line someone treats your daughter like that? My daughter better not drop her panties for some she just met. Let's just put it that way. Just really continuing to drive home how much of a catch he is. But regardless, now that she knows what happens on the couch, she's like, well, I guess I'll just sleep on this chair for the next week. And he goes, you're not sleeping on the couch or the recliner. You're sleeping in my bed, which is more unsanitary than the couch. I'm sure there's never been anyone in my bed, but me. I rolled my eyes. Give me a break. I'm absolutely serious. I beg them on the couch. I don't let them into my room. Just as if these women are like cockroaches and not whole people, but whatever. She's like, fine. And sure. And then she goes to shower in a bathroom that, by the way, does not lock, which is both despicable and immediately abused by Travis, who walks in when she's in the shower and is like, hey, you forgot a towel. And also I went through all of your luggage and brought you a change of clothes and your moisturizer and your toothbrush and just everything that you might need, which is an insane thing to do to this girl who, once again, he's only known for a few days, just going through all of her possessions just for fun, without permission to help because he's helping. She's like 2% mad at this and then gets over it instantly and calls him, quote, thoughtful and almost nice when he wanted to be. I would burn down his house, but that's just me. She goes from the bathroom into his room for the first time and notes immediately that all of his walls are blank except for the only decoration, which I cannot make this up. I truly wish that this book was satire, but it's not. The only decoration inside of this man's room is a gigantic sombrero that he keeps above his headboard. Abby moves on from this way too quickly. Like, what do you mean? You just have a lone sombrero and nothing else. This man is white. And when she comes in, Travis is just like Pillsbury Doughboy kind of sitting on his bed and he pats the pillow next to him like she's five and he's like tee hee hee nice pajamas that I picked out for you when I went through all of your clothes and she's pretty sleepy so he's like okay and then he leaves to shower and comes back to the room wearing only a towel of course finally at this point Abby gets a good look at his tattoos and they're tribal tattoos obviously what else would they be it's 2011 he's edgy he beats the shit of people for wealth and glory and he has a lone sombrero above his bed I don't know what you expected from him but he changes and then just lays back down on the other side of the bed and Abby has the audacity to be shocked by this development. She's like, you're sleeping here in the bed with me? And he's like, yeah, it's my bed. So I will be sleeping here. And so will you. And then he just leans over and whispers, good night, pigeon, into her ear. And they go to bed. And this is just, this is her life now. The next morning, take another shot because they have yet another conversation about how she will never sleep with him. And Travis hits her with the, I don't want to sleep with you, Pidge. I like you too much. Which like 50-50, it's kind of cute, but it's also, he kind of hates women. Either way, it's obvious that he likes her and yet somehow she takes this as him saying that she's ugly. Abby is not known for her brain. Everybody eats breakfast together at the house and America, evil incarnate, ends up staging an argument with Shepley where she's like, I don't want to go. It's your fraternity's date party. I'm not going to know anyone there and I'll just, I'll be so miserable and on my own and alone unless, unless I knew someone who was also there because someone else took her that I also know that I would know people and it would be so much fun and we would have so much fun together. And then she just kind of looks at Abby and Travis and Shepley shuts that shit right down. He's like, Travis never goes because he's anti-girlfriend and it wouldn't make sense for him to go to a date party where you bring your girlfriend. But obviously Travis and Abby take the bait and they agree to go as friends. So that's happening, but the party isn't for a month. So we're a ways off. An unknown amount of time passes after that. And they end up having an argument because Abby starts to believe that the rest of the school either A, thinks that she's one of Travis's slips, her words, not mine, or B, that they're dating, but Travis is still going out of his way to bang whoever he wants on the side. And in her head, 
said, both of those options seem pretty bad. Even though neither of them are really founded in reality, the school seems to be pretty understanding, actually, of this situation at this point in the book. And the way that Travis suggests that they solve this problem is going to the club and just, she sits there while Travis ogles other women in front of everybody from the school. Some random girl is going to follow us home from the bar? That's how you're going to make it up to me? You're not jealous, are you, Pigeon? Jealous of what? The STD-infested imbecile that you're going to piss off in the morning? Owned. Owned. Got him. Owned. Also, somehow that's just her bantering, I guess, because apparently she likes this plan, and that's what they end up doing. She gets on the back of his motorcycle, and they drive back to the apartment to change. He speeds, and she's like, you're gonna kill me. You forget that I'm riding with you. And he goes, it's hard to forget you're behind me when your thighs are squeezing the life out of me. A smirk came with his next thought. I couldn't think of a better way to die. And they invite Shepley and America to go out with them to this club. Plan club is a go. America and Abby apparently have the greatest fake IDs that the world has ever seen. And Travis is like, wow, those are really good. Why do you have them? And Abby's like, we've had them for a while. It was necessary. You know, in Kansas, where we are from, it was necessary in Kansas. Ha ha. Ha ha. They get into this club. Everybody's already plastered. Travis is immediately pulled away by this excessively voluptuous platinum blonde. But the twist of the night is that he buys two beers and then hands the other one to Abby instead. <laughs> like I would buy a beer for some chick at a bar. You're different. And then the two of them go out onto the dance floor and just start grinding next to America and Shepley. They're drunk. It gets kind of steamy. Travis starts kissing and then tonguing her neck. Just right there in the crowd giving this woman a lick, which finally crashes her back down to reality and she runs away back to the bar and starts literally chugging a beer. <laughs> Travis follows and he's like, Pigeon, what's the big deal? And she's like, I will never be trashed enough to f you. And it's right at this point that a woman named Megan, who is described on page as bouncing in all the right places, she appears and she goes, introduce me to your girlfriend. She smiled. I rolled my eyes. Travis tipped his head back to finish his beer and then slid his empty bottle down the bar. <laughs> Everyone waiting to order watched it until it fell into the trash can at the end. She's not my girlfriend. Just an absolute power play bowling with his empty beer bottle inside of a crowded club. But Travis takes Megan back out onto the dance floor and starts retribution making out with her to make Abby jealous, just very healthy stuff. And a new character who is mostly irrelevant, a man named Ethan, ends up sitting down next to Abby at the bar and they have this kind of normal, flirty conversation. She considers retribution making out with him, but before she has the opportunity to, in sweeps Travis again. And Ethan is instantly like, holy sh**, you're Travis Mad Dog Maddox. I saw you fight Sean Smith last year, man. I thought I was about to witness someone's death. Yet. Travis glowered down at him. You want to see it again? And Ethan just on the spot dips out. Can't blame him. Dylan Strauss is a very scary man. And the two of them argue some more and the conversation is stupid. It's dumb. But it also turns out that Ethan apparently committed SA. Just that's randomly dropped in there. So it's fine that Travis was like that. It's completely justified. But also let's be so real and true and vulnerable with ourselves. He would have acted the exact same way with literally any man. This is just the author trying to justify him being an insane person. But anyways, Abby is still super mad at him right up until he goes, I've been drinking, all right? Your skin was three inches from my face and you're beautiful and you smell f awesome when you sweat. I kissed you, I'm sorry, get over yourself. His excuse made the corners of my mouth turn up. You think I'm beautiful? And Abby is just like, tee hee, and then it's fine. They go home, they cuddle, he kisses her forehead. It's a lot. Their dynamic, this entire book, is unbelievably cursed. And the next morning, to exemplify this, Abby gets up to go get water from the kitchen, and Shepley is just sitting there watching her in what I imagine is like a dark room, and then he turns on the lamp, and he goes, I don't know what's going on with you and Travis, but I know he's going to do something stupid to piss you off. It's a tick he has. He doesn't get close with anyone very often, and for whatever reason, he's let you in, but you have to to overlook his demons. It's the only way he'll know. Know what? I asked, raising an eyebrow at his melodramatic speech. He answered simply if you'll climb over the wall. But worth noting as well that he's giving this entire speech with the real assumption in his heart that they really are just good friends. More on this betrayal soon. At this point, some more time passes and Travis starts acting like a baby again because he catches wind that Parker invited Abby to the frat party and he starts pouting and being short with her and storms off and then Shepley, once again, ever the wise sage, he goes, you should know by now that it takes patience and a forgiving attitude to be friends with Travis. He's his own universe. I shook my head. That's the Travis everyone else sees not the Travis I know. Just hilarious, given she's known him for maybe a week at this point in the story, that she's hitting his cousin and lifelong best friend with the, you just don't know him like I do, attack. <laughs> Not too sure about that one, but she ends up taking a nap and then waking up later that day and overhearing a conversation that Travis and America are having inside of the living room. And America is trying to convince Travis to ask Abby out because she's evil. And Travis is like, no, I don't want to. I like that we have something different than that. But America will not let it die. This woman wants her double date, but Abby decides to interrupt the conversation 
conversation at this point. And Travis ends up apologizing for being mean and weird earlier that day. Forgiveness. It's wonderful. And then out of nowhere, he gets a call from Adam because it's time for him to beat somebody up again. Easy to forget with all of this middle school level drama by day that Travis is a prize fighter by night. So America has Abby dress up for this fight in a deep cut yellow halter top and tight low rise jeans. Really just the 2011 going out uniform. And Travis sees this and then forces her to change because he doesn't want to have to worry about who's looking at her teeth when he's supposed to be focusing on beating his opponent into the cold concrete floor of the Jefferson Academic Building. She obliges. There isn't even a fight, you know. So what if this random man wants to dictate what she wears? It don't impress her much. And she puts on a t-shirt and the squad goes to the fight. And it turns out that the guy that Travis is fighting is from a different university because this fight club that Adam started has expanded to having different chapters at other schools. Once again, any questions that you might have about this, about how expanded they are, about whether Adam actually started the circle or if he just franchised it into their university, you're never gonna find out. So don't worry about it, it's Fight Club. Questions are for losers who are no longer in Fight Club. So at this fight, for some reason, Abby does not yet completely believe that Travis is the best that there's ever been. So she's all nervous about his safety. And Travis, to make her feel better that he's trying, I guess, is like, hey, I'll make a bet with you that he won't even get in one singular hit on me because I'm just that good. And what are the stakes of this bet? Let me lay it out for you. If Travis does get hit and Abby wins, Travis has to go for one entire month without sex. Truly a crippling loss for a man such as this. The nest of bacteria that's formed on his couch will just die out one by one. But if Travis wins, if he dunks on this guy from another school, then Abby has to continue staying with him for another month because apparently the hot water inside of her dorm had just been fixed today. So she was free. Truly, in my opinion, there is nothing in this for Abby, considering the fact that option B, she suffers because she has to continue living with him for no reason. But option A, even if she wins, she probably also suffers because abstinent Travis, when he already hates women, this is not somebody I want to be around. But instead of turning it down like a sane person, she's like, so true, this will be so fun. He goes out to fight. She ends up putting $200 on the fight with Adam on Travis winning, which he does, obviously. He's unparalleled. He has a fighting ability, the likes of which have not been seen for hundreds of years. That in the modern day, I guess, is really only useful in college basements to help pay his rents with the blood of his enemies. Travis obviously did not get hit, so Abby has lost this bet, and he ends up driving her back to her dorm to get some more clothes. And this man is covered in blood, but decides to walk up with her anyways to her room, because why not? Kara, the poor woman, is like, who is this strange man? Are you leaving? Like, are you moving out? What's going on? And Abby's just like, nope, lost a bet, and then bounces. No more explanation. Kara, once again, left confused and possibly scared. And they go back to the apartment, because they live together now, long term. I wonder how that's gonna go. I would say that at this point the vibes become different, but I would be lying to you because it's always been completely obvious how into Abby Travis is. But for some reason, it's only now that Shepley starts to freak the f out. Shepley burst out of his room and America ran after him. Shep, don't, she pleaded. His voice was low, but angry. You promised, Abby. When I told you to spare judgment, I didn't mean for you two to get involved. I thought you were just friends. We are, I said, shaken by a surprise attack. No, you're not, he fumed. <laughs> this man, has a truly empty head. If you looked inside of his skull, you would just see cobwebs and sadness. The fact that Abby has been sleeping next to Travis in his bed, in his room that apparently he's never brought a woman into before, and only now Shepley is like, hmm, maybe he's into her. It's frankly embarrassing. Like, Shepley is not smarter than a fifth grader. America and Abby have a conversation after this, after Shepley storms off again, where America is just like, I know you better than you know yourself. The only difference between you guys and me and Shepley is that you're not smashing. So just admit it, just admit that you have feelings for him and then make a terrible mistake. And Abby is like, no, I don't have feelings for him. He's not my type. Obviously she is lying to America, to herself, to me, and to anybody else who had no self-respect and was still reading at this point. But Travis walks in right then, obviously revealing that he's been eavesdropping the entire time. And he's just really furious with Abby. So to retaliate, he just leaves in the middle of the night. You're leaving? I asked, sitting up, where are you going? Out, he said. Truly a timeless classic, Travis's behavior in this scene. And Abby kind of tries to do the waiting on the recliner until he gets home thing, but eventually she's just too tired, so she drags herself to bed. And shortly after that, Travis comes back to the apartment, but he's not alone. He's brought not one, but two of his single-use girlies in tow. And because the walls of this apartment may as well not exist, Abby just has to lie there and listen as this man has a revenge threesome on the couch in the living room. Seconds later, moans, humming, and shouting filled the apartment. 
it sounded as if a graphic movie were being filmed in the living room. Just like imagine for a second being Shepley or even America, honestly, because before Abby came into the picture, this apparently was happening every single night. You can't even get up to get water in the kitchen. Like self-care for Shepley is buying himself a mini fridge and a pair of earplugs. I can't even really blame the guy for being the way that he is after being forced to listen to that constantly. But eventually the women are dismissed and Travis comes back to bed smelling of whiskey and of deep sadness and he passes out, but Abby can't sleep, which is reasonable. So she goes to sleep on the recliner instead. She wakes up late the next morning and God bless America for one of the only times in this book because she's packed up all of Abby's stuff and offers to drive Abby home just because of how insane and disrespectful what happened with Travis the night prior was. But before they can leave or even really talk about it at all, Travis walks in through the front door and Travis comes bearing gifts that he immediately starts preparing. When Pidge wakes up, let me know, okay? He said in a soft voice. I got spaghetti and pancakes and strawberries and that oatmeal sh with the chocolate packets. And she likes Fruity Pebble cereal, right, Mayor? You know, there is a pure, unadulterated, all-American toxicity inside of this relationship that I can't help but appreciate. Obviously, this is wild. Like, Travis feels bad for having a raucous threesome out of revenge and then decides to make up for it with breakfast? Okay, sure. Better yet, he apparently also got her shaving cream and a hair dryer because she's supposed to live there forever, so you gotta have the basics. It's insane. It's a level of delusional that we all aspire to achieve within our lifetimes. America actually defends Abby for maybe the first time, really reaping what she has sowed, by the way, in this book so far. I don't know how she expected anything other than this to happen. Shepley is just wasting away in the corner of the room because he has a profound fear of conflict, but Abby ends up making the baffling decision to just hit him with the, so what? No big deal. You live here and you can bring home whoever you want because we're not dating. It's none of my business what extracurricular activities you are doing that will wake me up in the middle of the night at three in the morning. I'll just buy earplugs, no big deal. And she's like, yeah, I mean, America did pack up all of my stuff, but I don't care. I'll unpack it. We made a bet. I'm true to my word, so I'll stay. Just absolutely no instinct for self-preservation inside of this woman, but she goes to take a shower. Travis goes through her shit again to bring her some clothes and presumably the new hair dryer. He apologizes to her again and she doubles down on pretending that there is just absolutely no reason that he has to apologize. Just a match made in hell in terms of ability to resolve conflict. And all she really has to say to him is don't drive drunk on your motorcycle next time, which I'll be honest, I didn't even put together was a thing that he did, but is definitely true. So he agrees and he leaves and then everything's fine, I guess, between the two of them. Cool. Some unknown amount of time later, Abby and her friends are all headed to this party that Parker invited her to. Travis is being overproductive. He's like, don't drink anything unless it comes from me. He literally says to this woman, you're not in Kansas anymore, pigeon which at the very least should mandate him to complete community service hours. But when Parker finally gets there, he's able to pull Abby away and they hang out on the balcony. We learn his lore. This man's a biology major. He's a junior who's currently studying for the MCAT and then plans on nepotisming his way into Harvard. You already know you're in. My dad went to Harvard. I mean, I don't know for sure, but he's a generous alumnus if you know what I mean. I carry a 4.0, got a 2200 on my SATs, 36 on my ACTs. I'm in a good position for a spot. Really glad that within maybe three total minutes of conversing, with this man. Abby knows not only that he's obscenely wealthy, but also that he got a really good ACT score. Just the essentials for their budding relationship. Parker asks her some questions. She says nothing of value in response, but for some reason he's enraptured anyways, because Abby is just that cool and sexy and interesting. And he offers to drive her home and they have a conversation about how home right now is her living with Travis. You're staying with Travis? I sort of lost a bet, so I'm there for a month. A month? It's a long story, I said, shrugging sheepishly. But you two are just friends? Yes. Then I'll take you to Travis's, he smiled. And this might seem very enlightened of him to respect her friendship with another man, because it's probably not obvious at this point to him that they're obsessed with each other. But the goodwill that he has here for being maybe the only character in this entire book that believes that men and women can be friends. Crazy, I know, but that will disappear. Just give it some time. Abby goes downstairs to tell her friends that she's gotten a ride home, and Travis essentially implies that Parker is going to undoubtedly take advantage of her. Parker Hayes? Pidge? Really? Parker Hayes? Hayes? He repeated with disdain. What kind of name is that anyway? I crossed my arms. Stop it, Trav. You're being a jerk. He leaned in, seeming flustered. I'll kill him if he touches you. I like him. I said, emphasizing every word. He seemed stunned at my confession, and then his features turned severe. Fine. If he ends up holding you down in the backseat of his car, don't come crying to me. Travis has such a vast collection of red flags in this book that you would think that he was planning to secede and start his own nation. But Abby goes home, and Parker apparently drives a $200,000 Porsche. Let me guess. It's the love of your life, I said, quoting Travis's statement about his motorcycle. No, it's a car. The love of my life will be a woman with my last name. Yep, 
Okay, um, he asks her out to a proper dinner when they're on the way home and then ends up walking her to the front door. And as she goes for the doorknob, she ends up falling into the entryway because Travis opens the door up for her because he's been watching this entire thing. How cool, how neat, how amazing. And Parker is apparently impossible to make uncomfortable. He's just rolling with the punches as Travis gives him some snark for no reason and acts like a weird shotgun dad who's waiting for his 14 year old daughter to get home. And after Parker finally leaves, we find out that Travis actually got a call to go in for a fight that night, but he decided not to because he wanted to make sure that Parker didn't kidnap and or kill her. So cool. Wonderful. They have a conversation and it goes nowhere. He finds out about the date that the two of them are going on, which leads him to go pout on the recliner instead of interacting with her. Just what a catch, this man. And the next day, Parker shows up to pick her up for this date and he goes, you are the most beautiful creature I have ever seen. Spoken like a true vampire pretending to be human so he can wear her skin. The two of them have a conversation in the car that really reveals their hands about how stupid they mutually are. I have to say, I was a bit nervous about picking up the woman Travis Maddox is in love with from his apartment. You don't know how many people have accused me of insanity today. And Abby is like, no, what do you mean? That's not what's happening. Just incapable of reading even basic signs. This woman never took driver's ed, but their date is nice. They talk about nothing of value yet again. She meets his mom who's just at this restaurant and she kind of judges her because she's so posh and rich. And we know these things because she's wearing ginormous jewels to announce her status to the world. But afterwards, Parker drives her home and the two of them share a little kiss on the doorstep. And Abby is overjoyed her heart is fluttering. She adores this plain white bread, old money rich boy. And she waves goodbye and then goes to open the door. And guess what? Travis opens it once again, so she falls in. And apparently Parker has nicknamed her Abs. So they have this conversation. Would you stop that? I said, closing the door behind me. Abs? What are you, a workout video? Pigeon, an annoying bird that craps all over the sidewalk. You like pigeon, he said defensively. It's a dove, an attractive girl, a winning card in poker. Take your pick. You're my pigeon. <laughs> I hate it here. Oh, genuinely barf. Why are you living with him? She moves on from this statement way too quickly, in my opinion. I don't think that you can explain away how unacceptable this nickname is. But they go upstairs to go to bed, and all of a sudden, Travis is being nice about the date. He seems to have a sincere interest in how it went and like asks her a bunch of nice questions, and she's like, wow, he really likes seeing me happy. As if none of this book so far has also been the case at the same time. And as if he's just cool with all of this. Spoilers, he's not, but don't worry about it. We'll get there. Parker and Abby keep going out seemingly every single day for about a week. And Travis continues doing that identical door thing over and over and over again. But Parker is just a Zen God. Like this behavior does not face him at all. He's like, I have nothing to worry about. And on the sixth or the seventh date that the two of them have, they just decide to make out inside of Parker's $200,000 Porsche outside of Travis's apartment because there's nowhere else to go. I guess nowhere that would be safer from the fact that he's definitely watching them from the window and true to form. Travis, who somehow had time to get extremely drunk, he starts banging his pasty Dylan Sprouse fist on the car window to interrupt them. And they have this incredibly stupid argument after Parker zooms away. I can't stand this, Pigeon. I feel like I'm going crazy. I threw out my hands and let them hit my thighs. You can't stand what? If you sleep with him, I don't want to know about it. I'll go to prison for a long time if I find out he... Just don't tell me. Travis, I seethed. I can't believe you just said that. That's a big step for me. That's what all girls say. I don't mean the sluts you deal with. I mean me, I said, holding my hands in my chest. I haven't, ugh, never mind. <laughs> I walked away from him, but he grabbed my arm, twirling me around to face him. You haven't what? He asked, weeping a bit. I didn't answer. I didn't have to. You're a virgin? So what? I said, the blood under my cheeks igniting. I had the same boyfriend all four years of high school. He was an aspiring Baptist youth minister. It never came up. I'm sure this doesn't surprise a single person watching this video. Of course she's a virgin. I read somewhere that if you aren't a virgin, they actually bar you from being a protagonist for a book like this. But hilariously, and because of course he does, once Travis hears that she's a virgin, he just forgives her instantly for the immense slight of daring to make out with a man that she's dating. And considering that he's still drunk and also just the most predictable man alive, when she puts him to bed, he starts trying to hook up with her. And she just defaults into being like, sure, you know, whatever, I guess I still think he's hot. Nothing better to do on a Tuesday immediately after my date with my other superior man. And she kind of just lets it happen and they almost end up smashing, except Travis has this brief moment of clarity and he's like, wait, I'm blackout drunk. Maybe we should hold off 
from doing this right now. And for some reason, Abby takes this as him thinking that she's ugly yet again. I seem to be the only girl he couldn't bring himself to sleep with, even when he was wasted. Get a grip. I say that with malice. Sincerely, get a fucking grip. I don't know where you're hiding away your brain cells, but you can't keep living like this. You need to be capable of at least one critical thought inside of your lifetime in order to deserve to survive. So they just go to bed and Abby, recognizing her complete lack of self-control, ends up going out to sleep on the recliner. And she wakes up to Shepley and America smashing through the non-existent paper-thin walls of this war zone of an apartment. And who stops by bright and early in the morning but Parker, Abby's basically boyfriend of one week now, who is here to deliver an early birthday present. Go ahead. I want to see your face when you open it. I slipped my finger under the tape on the underside of the box and then pulled the paper off, handing it to him. A rope of shimmering diamonds sat snugly in a white gold bracelet. How unbelievably wealthy and also delusional do you have to be to get a girl that you've known for about eight days a diamond bracelet and then deliver it to the house where you should damn well know by now that you will eventually get cucked. What a f***ing idiot. <laughs> Parker leaves and America and Shepley pull up to the scene and respond to the situation with just some really weird sitcom-esque lines. He bought you a diamond tennis bracelet? After a week? If I didn't know better, I would say you have a magic crotch. Shepley emerged from his bedroom, looking tired and satisfied. What are you fruitcakes streaking about in here? I hate them with everything inside of my being. Obviously, Travis hates the bracelet when he wakes up and he wants to have a DTR considering the events of the previous night, but Abby, avoidantly attached icon, she just decides to go with America to get new outfits and her hair and her makeup and her nails done. They do this a lot in this book. It's very girl, it's very gender of them. But the last errand is to pick something up from Brazil's house. Remember him? Except, surprise, Abby's surprise birthday party is happening. Isn't that crazy? Everybody says, surprise. Finch kisses her on the lips and he says, How happy birthday, baby, but Travis doesn't mind because Finch is gay and therefore puntable and non-threatening. Brazil cranked up the volume on the stereo and everyone screamed. Come here, Abby, he said, walking to the kitchen. He lined up shot glasses along the counter and pulled a bottle of tequila from the bar. Happy birthday from the football team, baby girl, he smiled, pouring each shot glass full of Patron. This is the way we do birthdays. You turn 19, you have 19 shots. You can drink them or give them away, but the more you drink, the more of these you get, he said, fanning out a handful of 20s. And Brazil looked looks at how small and frail and lady Abby is, and he assumes that the worst that the team will be down is like 60 bucks. But she uses this and somehow convinces them to go double or nothing, that she can finish 15 shots on her own for 40 bucks a shot instead of 20. And Brazil takes this bet on behalf of the team because he's never taken alcohol EDU, he maybe is just okay with killing her, and or he has no respect for her transcendent levels of self-confidence. But little does he know that Abby has been doing this exact game with her father since she was 16. And of Apparently, she always wins, which is actually insane. This is the first glimpse, by the way, into how unhinged this woman's dad is. Anyways, obviously Abby wins this bet, but at what cost? Because she has a great night when she's there, but then goes home and spends the wee hours of the morning yakking into a toilet while Travis holds her hair back. How sweet, how tender, great. He has the audacity in this moment to tell her not to drink so much in the future, which is really rich coming from a guy who drunk drives. But apparently, Shepley and America got into a fight because Shepley was like, hey, maybe don't encourage this woman to drink 15 shots of tequila. Like maybe possibly that would put her into the hospital. He called me irresponsible. Me. As if I don't know you. As if I haven't seen you rob your dad of hundreds of dollars drinking twice as much. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Actually, America, I think that maybe he's just assuming that Abby wants to have a working liver past the age of 25. Because the fact that she allegedly was drinking twice that number at like 17 is insane. Like have you considered looking in the mirror? Have you considered whether your definition of normal in this instance is greater than three standard deviations away from rational thought because endorsing that behavior as just normal and chill and a great way to make a couple of bucks is insane in any circumstance. America also yells at Abby for having the audacity to go and make out in the hallway with Parker on her birthday for five minutes. Do you even see what's going on? Travis quit fighting, which is a blatant lie by the way, I just want to put that out there. Travis quit fighting. He doesn't go out without you. He hasn't brought any girls home since the bimbo twins, has yet to murder Parker, and you're worried that people are saying you're playing them both? You know why that is, Abby? Because it's the truth. Two wolves inside me right now, because America does, dare I say, have a point. It is completely ridiculous behavior to be sleeping in the same bed as Travis, and then also accepting $10,000 diamond bracelets from Cutboy Parker. But the bar for America here is genuinely in hell. Like, let me remind you that the bimbo twins were approximately one week ago. This man has been reformed for no more than five business days, and you're telling me that you want your 
her best friends to press her luck on his ass when she currently has a hot and rich doctor boyfriend who's obsessed with her. Like when I say that America is the worst best friend in the Milky Way, this is what I mean. Anyways, they keep arguing and Abby is like, the only reason why I sleep in Travis's bed is because I made a bet and I'm good for my word. Okay. And then better yet, they acknowledge in the conversation that America was supposed to be helping to keep Abby away from danger, away from crime and criminal such as Travis because of her dark and secret past in Kansas. And we still don't know what that is by the way, but double bad best friend for having not only an absolutely terrible take, but also a take that is actively against the goals of the program for both of them. If somebody treats you like this in real life, do not be friends with them. You're just a source of entertainment because they just want to watch the world burn for you. I don't even kind of understand this friendship. It's just, it's absolutely atrocious. But anyways, they go home, America and Shepley make up because of course they do. And Travis gives Abby her birthday present. Hurry, I want you to be surprised. He smiled. Hurry? I asked, lifting the lid. My mouth fell open when a pair of big dark eyes looked up at me. A puppy? I shrieked, reaching into the box. I lifted the dark, wiry-haired baby to my face, and it covered my mouth in warm, wet kisses. Every girl from Kansas needs a toto, Travis said. <laughs> Surely not, right? Surely not. That's what I was thinking when I was reading this scene. I was like, surely he did not just get her a live creature, but he sure did. And apparently Abby can't keep animals inside of her dormitory. She's a college freshman. So Travis is like, no worries. I'll just take care of it here. So that way you have to visit me constantly forever, even after the bed is over. And also it turns out that Toto here was a complete surprise because they've never even talked about dogs. Abby even says to him, she's like, I've never had a dog. So we'll see how this goes. Like I cannot imagine being in this situation and thinking that getting the woman the dog is the right move. Absolutely deranged behavior from this man. But yeah, now there's a puppy running around this apartment at all times. What a cool, fun addition. They go to school the next day and apparently everybody in college is spreading rumors now that Abby smashed both of her hooves on the same day. And this, I guess, is the first thing that was capable of breaking Parker's apparent zen with this entire situation. I heard Parker's furious. He said he came by your apartment yesterday and you and Travis were still in bed. They were taking a nap, Chris. America sneered. Just imagine for a second being this man. Imagine going to see if your basically girlfriend has slept with another man that she's been living with this entire time, except they're just friends. They're just friends, I swear. And her best friend is just like, no, don't go in there. She's napping with that guy who's known for his capacity to murder that she told you not to worry about. It would be over for me. My ego could not take that. Anyways, Chris, who's the guy who brought this up, he teases the two of them a little bit more. And so Travis just ends up beating him up in the middle of the cafeteria, just as one does on a college campus. I'm sure that you guys all have this experience. And Travis quite literally runs away after this. And America has this really cool idea to chase him down with Abby. The only thing that stopped him was your voice, Abby. He'll listen to you. You need to talk to him. Absolutely terrible take, by the way. I just want to put that out there. Just more proof that America is a demon who's waiting to suck the soul out of Abby's dying body. But they end up finding him. The two of them have a conversation. It's awful. I wrapped my arms around him. We have to be friends. I won't take no for an answer. His eyebrows pulled in and then he cried cradled me to him with both arms, still staring out the window. I watch you sleeping a lot. You always look so peaceful. I don't have that kind of quiet. I have all this anger and rage boiling inside of me, except when I watch you sleep. This is how you end up on Dateline. Like hearing and seeing shit like this from a bottom of the barrel quality man and then continuing to fight on like he won't one day kill you. None of this should be a surprise. When she met him, he was covered in blood. If not then, Abby should have known from the moment that she entered this man's room and it was just four empty walls and a sombrero that something was terribly wrong. Also, apparently Parker didn't walk in on both of them napping. He walked in on Travis watching Abby sleep, which I do think is worse. I too would not know how to handle that situation, but when Travis tells her this, Abby is just like, well, he should just get over it. <laughs> if he believes the gossip, it's his own fault. It's hard to think anything else when he sees us in bed together. He knows I'm staying with you. I was fully clothed for Christ's sake. Okay, sure. Yeah. Incredibly convincing Abby. Keep it up. The next day, Abby has a completely useless conversation with Finch where he's like, quit pretending. And she's like, what are you trying to say? That I'm closeted and gay like you once were, you man who likes other men. And he's like, no, just admit that you like Travis. And she hits him with the, well, actually I have some unresolved childhood trauma. I had Mick Abernathy for a father. Who's that? I giggled. See, it's not a big deal if you don't know who he is. 
Who is he? A mess. The gambling, the drinking, the bad temper. It's hereditary in my family. America and I came here so I could start fresh, without the stigma of being the daughter of a drunken has-been. And that is only the smallest fraction of the beauty of this woman's backstory. We're gonna get to it, but anyways, she's like, yeah, Travis reminds me of my dad, which, whoa, I mean, at least she's self-aware, but that is a crazy thing to say. Absolutely no resolution inside of this conversation, and eventually Finch leaves, he kisses her again, and Travis slash dad witnesses it and goes, tee hee, hey now, you silly goose. And on his way out, Finch just ends up using some nickname for her that reminds her of her dark past. So Travis goes, do you want me to go beat the piss out of Finch? Teach him a lesson? I'll take him out. I couldn't help but smile. If I wanted to take Finch out, I'd just tell him Prada went out of business and he'd finish the job for me. Got him, so true, queen. Women be shopping, women be manicures, and gays be Prada. It's 2011, it's the most 2011 piece of media you've ever seen. Anyways, the two of them go to the cafeteria of communion together where half of this book takes place and Abby feels like everybody is staring at her given the rumors that are currently being spread and what does Travis do to make her feel better? What could possibly be his brilliant idea? Um, he breaks out into song. Travis watched me for a moment, noted those staring, and then stood up. I can't, he yelled. I stared in awe as the entire room jerked their heads in his direction. Travis bobbed his head a couple of times to a beat in his head. Shebley closed his eyes. Oh no. Travis smiled. Get no satisfaction, he sang. He kept belting out the lyrics as he climbed onto the table as everyone stared. He pointed to the football players at the end of the table and they smiled and yelled the lyrics back in unison. The whole room clapped to the beat. Travis sang into his fist and danced past me. The whole room chanted in harmony. Somehow the entire football team just knows to and is unabashedly willing to sing back up in this moment. The football players were humming the bass line. Na, 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 na. Wrong bass line, by the way. That's not how you spell that. But I'm not surprised considering the fact that nobody who knows what a bass is, nobody who had ever seen a bass in their entire life, would ever write this scene. I imagine that we were supposed to find this cute, but if I were Abby, I would drop out. <laughs> I would never be able to show my face in this school ever again. But for some reason she's like wow how sweet you know maybe all the world is a stage for a cool guy like you <laughs> and out of nowhere Parker shows up he saw all of this cucked yet again in honestly a worse way honestly if another guy stole my girl via a choreographed public musical number it would be over for me my ego would just erode away into the great river of regret and sadness but Parker I guess just has an iron will or perhaps just a tiny little pea brain because he comes to apologize to Abby he's like yeah I'm really sorry for being so mad about when I walked in on Travis watching you sleep in his bed next to him. I guess that was an overreaction after all, considering how friends you are, that's why he publicly saying to you. So that happens, but to his credit, Parker also acknowledges that he doesn't love that Abby is sleeping in Travis's bed, so he basically requests that they take a break for now, and then after the bed is over and she's moved back in with the roommate that she hates, then they can try to date again. And Abby is like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Just want a guy, Parker Hayes. After that point, we get a time skip to the last day of the bet, and we're told that during this time, Travis and Abby are bowling. They're play wrestling, haha. Ha. They're snuggling with that living creature that he bought her for her birthday, completely unsolicited. And the last night comes around and Travis is just like, hey, what if you just moved in here with me forever? And Abby is like, you know I can't do that. But he's sad, so she goes to kiss the corner of his mouth to make him feel better, which feels risky. And it is risky because he turns into her and they end up making out, which you saw this coming a mile away because the two of them have no self-control. Honestly, the bigger surprise is that it hasn't happened up to this point, but they finally smash and Abby talks in her internal monologue about how Travis is going where no man has gone before, like he's a part of the fucking moon landing. There are approximately four sentences of foreplay and then it's over just as quickly as it began. Anyways, you've probably spent most of this book so far thinking that, yeah, you know, Abby might be stupid and a little bit annoying, but Travis is definitely the problem in this relationship. Like he's for sure the toxic one. And this is still mostly true, but there is evil inside of Abby as well, because it turns out in a dramatic twist that the only reason that she did all of this, the only reason that she slept with this man was so that he would let her leave the apartment the next day and just toss her away like one of his disposable hoes because she just thinks that that's how all sex works for him. I had thought once Travis slept with me, his curiosity would be satiated, but instead he was talking about forever. My eyes snapped shut with the thought of his expression when he learned that 
that what had happened between us wasn't a beginning, it was closure. I couldn't go down that road and he would hate me when I told him. So instead of facing her problems after he wakes up, she just decides to disappear under the cover of night and she goes and she wakes up America and she's like, hey, can you help me sneak out and go back to the dormitory? And America is just like, this is so you. <laughs> because this is just how Abby handles all of her problems, apparently, just running away and not dealing with it. And I wish I could make fun of her more for that, but unfortunately it do be like that for me on occasion. So she gets back to her dorm in the wee hours of the morning and she goes to bed. And then apparently starting at eight in the morning, her phone starts ringing and it continues to ring every five minutes for about an hour. And keep in mind, she shares this dorm room with a living person, but never once does she think to put it on silence because God forbid Kara deserves even a moment of peace in her own home. But yeah, she doesn't pick up. She continues ghosting until someone starts banging on her door. And surprisingly, it's America. Kara yanked on the knob. What? America pushed past her and stood beside my bed. What in the hell is going on? She yelled. Her eyes were red and puffy and she was still in her pajamas. I sat up. What, Mare? Travis is a fucking wreck. He won't talk to us. He trashed the apartment, threw the stereo across the room. He took a swing at Shep when he found out we helped you leave. Abby, please tell me, she pleaded, her eyes glossing over. It's scaring me. The fear in her eyes forced only the partial truth. I just couldn't say goodbye. You know, it's hard for me. It's something else, Abby. He's gone fucking nuts. I heard him call your name and then he stomped all over the apartment looking for you. He barged into Shep's room demanding to know where you were. Then he tried to call you over and over and over. She sighed. His face was... Jesus, Abby, I've never seen him like that. He ripped his sheets off the bed and threw them away, threw his pillows away, shattered his mirror with his fist, kicked his door, broke it from the hinges. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, first of all, this is wild. I'm sure you saw it coming though, because let's be real, at no point in this book does Travis even present an illusion of stability and emotional regulation. Obviously, if a man does this, we don't hang anymore, okay? You don't talk to him ever again. It's not where this book is going, but if this was me or somebody I love, we change our names we dye our hair, we transfer schools. And with that in mind, I'm sure that this is where America is going to apologize to Abby for just getting Travis all wrong and then trying to force them to be together. If we are so charitable, maybe she couldn't have known that he was going to be capable of such violence. So this is the part where they're going to like form an escape plan so that way Abby stays safe, right? 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 I can't be with him, I whispered, keeping my eyes on the ceiling. Her hand covered mine and she spoke softly. Travis needs work. Trust me, I understand any and all reservations that you have about him, but look how much he's already changed for you. Think about the last two weeks, Abby. He's not Mick. <laughs> Surely not. What? You're going to break his heart, Abby. You're going to break his heart. The only girl he trusts enough to fall for and you're going to nail him to the wall. So you're telling me that this man who not only beats the shit out of people for a living, but also trashed an apartment, shattered a mirror with his fist and also threw a punch at your loving and doting boyfriend all because Abby went back to her dorm. You're telling me that this is the man that you're willing to go to bat for as Abby's best friend? As theoretically somebody with a vested interest in Abby's health and safety, you think that she should be getting together with this man? You have to be unbelievably delusional to think that somehow Abby is the person who's in the wrong here in this situation proportionally to what's actually happened instead of being somebody who's in the middle of dodging the most unstable bullet that she will ever see in her life. Like America is just picking her up and putting her right back into the line of fire for that sick ricochet. Look how much he's already changed for you. What do you mean? The revenge threesome on the couch of shame and despair? That was less than three weeks ago. And America truly believes that she knows anything about this man's inner world. Like this is when you aid in a bet, okay? You help your best friend escape so that way she lives past the age of 25. You do not sit her down and force her to call him and then bully her into dating him. Like, what are you doing? You suck, worst friend of the year. Maybe the worst friend I've ever read in a romance novel. It is insane how awful this woman is. If there were Oscars for such a thing, she would be on stage. Abby ends up calling Travis, essentially at gunpoint because of America. And she's like, yeah, we're not together. Is that fine? And he's like, no, it's, it's not fine. Actually. Actually, I'm miserable and I hate it here. And she's like, so it goes, but don't be weird tomorrow because we're friends, ha ha ha. I just love being friends with you. And then she hangs up on him. And then immediately as if on cue, Parker calls her and they end up planning a date because this is the day that she's finally free. And America is so salty watching this, like dead sea salty, this woman. Fast forward after this to the cafeteria of communion. And let me just say, by the way, that the fact that Travis trashed his entire apartment and almost punched Shepley in the face, we will never revisit this for the entire
entire rest of this book is just forgotten entirely because it's just what you do I guess when you face even the smallest microscopic amounts of rejection you experience a mental break and then you do terrible things and then you don't feel bad about them this is the school of thought that everybody in this book seems to subscribe to the two of them have an awful conversation about how she ghosted him are we supposed to pretend the other night never happened no why I feigned confusion and he sighed frustrated with my behavior I don't know because I took your virginity or maybe because you shattered a mirror with your fist afterwards that might be another reason to not just you know move on from it but whatever that's just me yes so true he owns her now I'd forgotten that that was the logic in books like these later Abby gets ready for this date without America because America is boycotting this relationship she's very upset that Abby has chosen an emotionally stable and kind rich man over the incarnate human version of it gets better in season in 27 you just have to keep watching and it'll all be worth it you know like the wants and the desires of her best friends of many years irrelevant who cares Parker picks her up from her dorm and they have this interaction he slid in beside me and leaned over touching each side of my face kissing me with his plush soft lips wow he breathed I've missed your mouth <laughs> Not a line that will do numbers for his case, but he sure does say it out loud. Abby goes through this date, and the entire time she's thinking to herself, like, oh no, the joy and the excitement I used to feel with Parker is just gone. Travis took it away from me when he performed the moon landing. And at this point, Travis performs a power move because he's a child, and he calls her when he knows that she's on this date to arrange for the two of them to go bowling the next day because they're friends. They're such good friends. And Parker sees this, obviously, and he's like, wow, you know, that was Travis, and you're still just friends with him, right? You're, you're just friends. And Abby's like, like, yup, nothing to see there, just a void, a deep chasm of friendship as far as the eye can see. They eat at his apartment and they start hooking up and she just isn't very into it, so she pulls away and she goes, okay, I think a single is all you'll be hitting tonight. And Parker's not evil, so he's not phased by this and he starts trying to make follow-up plans with her and he invites her to that date party that his fraternity is doing, remember that? And Abby sincerely has to look this man in the eyes and go, yeah, sorry, I'm sort of already going with Travis, you know, that guy who I share an expansive and eternal abyss of friendship with. Yeah, he's my date to the date party that everybody goes to with their girlfriends. Can't do anything about it. And Parker, this poor man, is like, what do you expect me to do? Sit at home alone while you're at my fraternity's date party with someone else? Should I ask another girl? You can do what you want, I said, irritated with his threat. He looked up and shook his head. I don't want to ask another girl. I don't expect you not to go to your own party. I'll see you there. All right, he sighed in resignation. This is obviously an issue I'm going to have to work through. Travis is one of your best friends. I do understand that. I don't want it to affect our relationship, okay? Every appearance by Parker so far in this book is just him being like, wow, this is pretty weird. Aw, shucks, I guess that's just how it is. Like, Abby, you are going to make this man into an incel. Parker is going to be an active 4chan user by the end of this book. Never once in this book will she consider whether how she's acting could possibly be impacting him. It's a gift, truly, that she has to be that conceited. Abby runs to America on the way home and they debrief and America's like, you better still be going to the date party with Travis because if you don't, then I'm going to make it into a problem between the two of us. Just really cool friend behavior once again. And then Travis just shows up completely unsolicited to her dorm room to drive her around on his Harley Davidson of death and destruction. And because Abby's will is like jello and she has no self-respect, she decides to go and he ends up giving this monologue to her. I know we're f***ed up, all right? I'm impulsive and hot-tempered and you get under my skin like no one else. You act like you hate me one minute and then you need me the next. I never get anything right, and I don't deserve you, but I f***ing love you, Abby. I love you more than I've loved anyone or anything ever. When you're around, I don't need booze or money or the fighting or the one-night stands. All I need is you. You're all I think about. You're all I dream about. You're all I want. Less than 48 hours post demolition of the apartment, by the way. And Abby chooses radical honesty here. She's like, yeah, here's the thing. You remind me of my dad, so it's just not gonna work. And Travis is like, oh, that's it? No worries, I'll just change. And she's like, so true, you'll just change. And then on the spot, she calls Parker from Travis's phone, cancels their follow-up date, which was supposed to be the next day. It's like four in the morning. And she's like, yeah, remember that friend who I was friending and being friends with while we were seeing each other? Turns out I'm in love with him. Isn't that crazy? To his credit, Parker hangs up on her. It's like his one act of self-love inside of this entire book. And just like that, Abby and Travis, everything is healed. They go home to smash on his new sheets and his new bed with his new pillows because all of the old ones were thrown away or broken. And it turns out that he got rid of all of his condoms when Abby left because he was just planning to take a vow of celibacy. So there's a little bit of a kink in this plan that they have to smash. And Abby, seeing this and using all three of her brain cells to form a response, she's like, oh, no worries. Just go in without a spacesuit. What's the worst that could happen? 
happen. It's only the moon and a man who has been to every other planet in this entire galaxy. She does some math in her head about where she is in her cycle and is like, yeah, it's completely fine. Which is insane. If I'm smashing a man within weeks of him being known as the dude who slept his way across the entire college campus, we're making the stop at CVS. But whatever. Obviously, nothing happens. It's fine. Abby is like, I'm not leaving this time in the morning, so you don't have to worry about that. And they're just together now. Really, zero to 100 within about 10 pages. And you're probably thinking that this is happening pretty early in the video, but truly it is just in time to be the backdrop for some of the dumbest shit you have ever seen. Presumably the next day, the new couple goes once more into the cafeteria. And that very same dude that Travis beat up earlier in the book in the cafeteria for making fun of him, he just makes the bold decision to make fun of him again. And he makes this joke about how Travis looks really happy and it must be because they finally smashed. And Abby bravely convinces Travis not to beat the shit out of this guy. But then he calls Travis whiffed and Abby is like, oh well, you tried. You know, I guess you can go do the violence if you want. Travis lifted Finch's tray off the table and swung it into Chris's face, knocking him off the chair. Chris tried to scramble under the table, but Travis pulled him out by his legs and then began to wail on him. Chris curled into a ball and then Travis kicked him in the back. Chris arched and turned, holding his hands out, allowing Travis to land several punches to his face. The blood began to flow and Travis stood up, winded. Once again, happening on school grounds, on school property. Nobody here seems to care. Once again, the only adult at this university is that professor from chapter one who gave the lecture on the president with the ugly wife. So nobody else is employed here. Travis can just do whatever he wants. And after this, Travis starts freaking out because because apparently the Whisper Network at the university is saying that all of the men on campus just secretly want to smash Abby now because she just has that magic within her that made even Travis, of all people, settle down. And Travis's poor tiny man brain cannot handle this new level of competition, so he just starts like pacing around and seething. And then out of nowhere, as he does, Parker shows up, the poor guy, and he goes, I just heard what happened in the cafeteria. I don't think you realize what you're getting yourself into. Travis is bad news, Abby. Everyone knows it. No one is talking about how great it is that you've turned him around. They're all waiting for him to do what he does best. I don't know what he's told you, but you have no clue what kind of person he is. Which honestly, yes, it's a cope. I mean, he just got dumped. But also, all things considered, it's pretty reasonable considering that Travis just left a bleeding mass on the cafeteria floor. But the fundamental moral difference between Parker and Abby is that Abby knows this. She has no reason to want to be with this guy other than the fact that he's obsessed with her. Everything that he's actually done has been either like a terrible red flag or the bare minimum. There is nothing that Parker can say that will make a difference when Travis's own behavior has not dissuaded her. So obviously she just kind of shoes him away. The two of them keep dating and Travis is like super rude now to all of the women who try to flirt with him. And Abby is like, yes, so hot how he's unnecessarily mean to all other women except for me. They go to a Halloween party. Travis gets mad at her for getting a free drink from the bar when he really should be proud of her economic sensibilities. Some random guy looks at her funny and literally just goes, where do you think you're going? And Travis punches him in the middle of the club. And Abby is not mad that the punch happens, but rather that she was too close to the punch and was kind of knocked off balance, and they have an argument about it, and Travis goes, I wouldn't have swung if I thought I could have hit you. You know that, right? It's a defense that only the best who ever do it can have. The perfect fighter, the I have never been inaccurate or challenged even one time in my life defense. But somehow, of all things that have happened so far in this book, this is finally the moment where Abby is mad and Travis ends up going, I'm gonna f up. I'm gonna f up a lot. Pidge, but you have to forgive me. I'm gonna be the worst boyfriend that you've had in your life. I'm not really gonna listen to you ever even one time. I'm not going to respect any other women, but if you're lucky, maybe I'll have like a modicum of respect for you at some point. And really our relationship will be the greatest mistake that you make in your life. But dude, just trust me. I love you and therefore stay with me. America ends up taking Abby back to her dorm from the bar. And the next day, Travis shows up on his literal hands and knees asking for forgiveness inside of her dorm room. Poor f***ing Kara, just trying to get through the academic year. Forced yet again to witness this nonsense at like eight in the morning. And Abby, of course, ends up being like, okay, I guess I'll forgive you if you just promise to try really, really hard to not beat people up for looking at me anymore, okay? And he's like, yes, Pidge, anything Pidge, and it's healed yet again. So Travis leaves. Kara says the only reasonable thing that anybody says in this entire book, do you know what codependency is, Abby? Your boyfriend is a prime example, which is creepy considering he went from having no respect for women at all to thinking that he needs you to breathe. Absolute bar from this woman. My respect for her just continues to grow to new heights every single day. He says I'm different. Sure he does. But why? Why do you care? I snapped. It's dangerous to need someone that much. You're trying to save him and he's hoping you can. You two are a disaster. I smiled at the ceiling. It doesn't matter what or why it is. When it's good, Kara, it's beautiful. 
broken up a little bit, but there it is. That's the title of the book. And that's also the psychology behind why so many people stay in unbelievably toxic relationships. I just feel like we can draw a very clear through line from Edward Cullen to Travis Mad Dog Maddox to Christian Grey to any man exactly like this who is propped up as what women want, but in reality belongs in prison. Obviously, Abby does not listen to Kara. Why would Abby listen to Kara? She makes no good points. Soon after this, Abby and Travis are hanging out when he ends up getting a call from one of his brothers with a name that starts with T, who lets him know that there's going to be a family gathering in approximately 30 minutes. So Travis is like, okay, Abby, hey, it's time to meet my entire family for the first time completely spontaneously. I've given you no notice. Please be ready from zero within seconds because we have to go. They get there and she meets his dad and all of his brothers and it's poker night and apparently nobody in the family misses poker night. There are people who fly out for poker night, but they could only tell Travis that this was happening 30 minutes in advance for some reason. And apparently this guy's house is just full of framed pictures of Travis's grandfather with various professional poker players. And this is just to demonstrate how seriously they take poker in this house, I guess, but whatever. They offer to deal Abby in and she's like, I don't know if I should. And Travis is like, no, babe, I'll teach you. And she's like, okay, I guess. And she ends up absolutely policing these nerds. She takes home like the entire pot. Everybody's mad at her in that kind of wholesome, like we like you, but also fuck you for taking our money kind of way. And they quickly put together that Abby is not a new poker player. Thomas, who is the oldest brother and the straight edge one, he like works for the FBI or something. Thomas is onto her and he's like, what did you say your last name was? And Abby has the audacity to be like, I can't believe they're finding me out. This is such a surprise as if they're not all apparently supposed to be the biggest poker fans that there's ever been. As if she's not in a room surrounded by photos of famous poker players. She's like, rats, how could this have happened? <laughs> Are you related to Mick Abernathy by any chance? Thomas asked. All heads turned in my direction and I nervously raked my hair back with my fingers. How do you know Mick? Travis angled his head to look into my eyes. He's only one of the best poker players that ever lived. Do you know him? I winced, knowing I'd finally been cornered into telling the truth. He's my father. I peered over at Travis who stared at me in awe. You're lucky 13, he asked, his eyes a bit hazy. And at this point, we finally learn a portion of Abby's backstory because her dad was apparently like unbelievably cracked, insane talent, you know, once in a generation poker master, all the way up until Abby's 13th birthday, when allegedly all of his luck disappeared and transferred into her. And Abby goes on to start apparently playing in pro tournaments. She's winning against like insane veterans. She's amazing. She's getting all of this hype. Well, at the same time, her dad's career is completely going to shit. Obviously, this creates a lot of the resentment and alcoholism and just generally being a terrible fatherness that we've seen so far in this book, this is the primary reason for that. And everybody in this house is freaking out over this new development. Travis is like, you're so hip and cool and interesting, like I already thought you were because I'm obsessed with you, but now I will be obsessed with you forever and there's no escaping. And also, importantly, we learn here that Abby's poker expertise apparently extends to all betting. So that bet at the beginning of this book with Travis, she lost it on purpose because she never loses any bets ever unless she wants to. She's like, Travis, but for fighting of the mind. Also worth noting that, like Travis said, his family is entirely wholesome. Strange to imagine that he went from getting beaten up every day from like age four onward to wholesome poker nights with his dearly beloved brothers who also adore his girlfriend. Things that boggle the brain for 500, Alex. But time skip after this and they're back at college and it turns out that Parker has been telling people that Abby is still calling him. So nobody is safe, apparently, in this book. Not a single man can be anything less than insufferable. But in revenge, Travis and Abby just decide to make out in front of him and somebody goes, I think he just got her pregnant, just very 2011, with Parker continuing to seethe in the background of this scene. The book skips chapter 13, which is very thematic of it, considering Abby's past, and we fast forward to Travis having a surprise. One man walked in backward, carrying a plastic-covered gray sofa, followed by another man bringing in the rear. Shepley and Travis moved the couch, with me and Toto still on it, forward, and then the men sat the new one in its place. Travis pulled off the plastic and then lifted me in his arms, setting me on the soft cushions. Yup, the couch of debauchery is no more. His old life is done. Also, so I just want to say that it's very brave of her to be sitting on that couch, just knowing what's happened there, knowing that Travis has likely never even one time cleaned it. In fact, it's almost kind of cruel to let the dog up by you in this instance. Toto does not know what has come to pass in this location. You might have the ability to make that decision with all of the available knowledge, but Toto does not. Toto's an innocent. But either way, it doesn't matter anymore because I guess they have a new couch. But that apparently isn't even what all of the hype is about because it turns out that Travis has gotten a surprise wrist tattoo. He pulled the bandage back and I gasped at the black script tattoo tattooed across the underside of his wrist, the skin around it red and shiny from the antibiotic he had smeared on. I shook my head in disbelief as I read the word, pigeon. <laughs> ah! <laughs> 
<laughs> insanity. This is insanity. Even America in this scene, like the patron saints of bad decisions in this book, even America is like, hey, maybe you should have asked your girlfriend of one week first before you made this choice. And Travis is incredulous. He's just like, what? Asked her? No, I don't need to do that. I wanted the stupid fucking nickname that I gave her tattooed on my wrist in perpetuity. And that's not even it because he also got a rib tattoo. What is that? I asked, squinting at the vertical symbols. It's Hebrew, Travis said with a nervous grin. What does it mean? It says, I belong to my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Pairs perfectly with the sombrero above his bed and also his tribal tattoos. All he needs now is like a mistranslated kanji on his ankle. That would complete the set, I think. But anyways, Abby, avoidant as always, and facing a situation that would make even securely attached people go insane, she's like, okay, this is a lot. I need to go be drunk. And she goes to the cabinet and takes a shot. And Travis follows her and he's like, sorry, babe, you know, one thing led to another. And then I was just suddenly picking out a language I don't speak for a tattoo that represents our week long relationship. You know how it is. We're going to this date party tomorrow. It's supposed to be this big deal where we're announcing our relationship or something. And now you have my name on your arm in this proverb talking about how we belong to each other. It's freaky, okay? I'm freaked out. Travis grabbed my face and planted his mouth on mine. And then he lifted me off the floor, setting me on the counter. His tongue begged entrance into my mouth. And when I let him in, he moaned. His fingers dug into my hips, pulling me closer. You are so fucking hot when you're mad. Yeah, okay. Time skip, no resolution, but now they're getting ready for the date party. America and Abby are out on the town. They're having a women be shopping, women be waxing sort of day. Once again, very gender of them, like everything in this book. Men and women can never be friends because men do not be shopping and women do not be motorcycles. But whatever, they come back and apparently every surface inside of Travis and Shepley's apartment is now covered in roses. Reds, pinks, yellows, and whites. It looks like a floral shop. Oh my God, America squealed when she walked through the door. Shepley looked around him, standing proud. We went to buy you two flowers, but neither of us thought just one bouquet could do it. Yeah, you know how it is. We had to drain Travis's Roth IRA to afford 3,000 roses, and we'll have to throw them all away, I guess, because we can't live like this, but really pretty, right? Really nice of us. <laughs> they get dressed, they show off said dresses, and Travis is like, Abby, your dress is too slutty. <laughs> you look too good, too fire, but also really could you change because you're too slutty. And Abby actually stands her ground here until he gives up, which progress, I guess he didn't enact his will through force this time. And they go to this party. They dance, they be merry, they drink alcohol. And because he has absolutely no filter, Travis is like, wow, getting this tattoo feels so good. If it feels this good to have this on my arm, I can't imagine how it's going to feel to get a ring on your finger. Travis. In four or maybe five years he added. This man needs to be stopped. He makes Parker getting her a diamonds bracelet after a week of dating look like the most typical thing in the world for a man to do. But at this point, before it can become a thing, America finds Abby and is like, hey, so my parents called and remember how your abusive dad was abusive and the worst? And then we crossed state lines to escape him so that way you'd never have to see him again. Yeah, he called my parents one time and they just thought it would be best if they told him exactly where you were. And so now he's on his way. Oh, and actually he's just here right now, just at the frat party. Your dad is outside, you should go talk to him. So Abby does, she goes and has this conversation. Well, 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 Cookie, you can take the girl out of Vegas. Shut up, Mick, just turn around and go back to wherever you came from. I don't want you here. I can't, Cookie, I need your help. What do you want? I seem to have gotten myself in a pickle, kiddo. Old dad needs some money. I close my eyes, how much? 25. He means 25,000, and apparently he owes this money to a guy named Benny, who I can only assume is the figurehead of some chapter of the Italian Mafia. Bad people to owe a large sum of money to that you cannot pay. So Abby is like, well, you will die if I don't help you out, but I only have the 11 grand so far that I've made off of betting on Travis to win throughout the semester. Which, by the way, is insane that she's been able to make money at all on that, considering that he's never lost before. I feel like the odds of betting on him must be terrible, considering how much of a favorite he is, but apparently in the last two months alone, she's been able to make 11 grand. But this is not enough to pay the mob to not kill her father. So Mick ends up being like, just go play some poker. You're gonna be able to make infinite amounts of money because you stole my luck, you evil bitch who is also my daughter. And Abby is like, my life, I guess that's a decent idea. And she just 
just spontaneously books flights for the four of them to go to Vegas to gamble. So they all go. That's where this story is going. We're on a field trip away from our two primary settings. Now, you can't gamble in Vegas unless you're 21. So America and Dabby get ready to make themselves look older. They whip out the fake IDs and they go. All of them are moral support in this instance. So they all go regardless of liability, but it's really up to Abby to make enough money. So Abby walks up to the veteran's table that has a lot of people who look fairly rich and she decides to pull the pretending to be bad strategy once again, as these men at the table are just throwing a bunch of randomly generated patronizing nicknames at her. Good evening, gentlemen. Mind if I join you? Share sweet cheeks. Grab a seat and look pretty. Just don't talk. I want in, I said, handing America my sunglasses. There's not enough action at the blackjack tables. One of the men chewed in his cigar. This is a poker table, princess. Five card draw. Try your luck on the slot machines. I sat in the only empty seat, making a show of crossing my legs. I've always wanted to play poker in Vegas, and I have all these chips, I said, setting my rack of chips on the table, and I'm really good online. All five men looked at my chips and then at me. There's a minimum ante, sugar, the dealer said. How much? 500, peach. Listen, I don't want to make you cry. Do yourself a favor and pick out a shiny slot machine. She absolutely destroys these men, of course. She's the best to ever do it. We've been over this before, but she's only able to make approximately three grand before out of nowhere comes her ex-boyfriend, who we were told, mind you, was a Baptist minister, but apparently is instead the heir to the throne of the casino. Very different things, although I guess this place was as close to a church as Abby might have had growing up, but this guy's name is Jesse, and he seems nice. I mean, I don't really know how to characterize this man since truly we see so little and yet every aspect of him raises so many questions. But obviously he knows not only who she is, but also that she's too young to be able to gamble inside of the casino. And I just want to put this out there. Why are you at his family's casino? You could go anywhere else on the entire Vegas Strip. Why not just go to any of the other dozens of possible casinos where the odds of somebody recognizing you are significantly smaller to carry out your operation of saving your father's life? This error is obviously not acknowledged by the book, but it is is profound, in my opinion. Jesse, it turns out, does run the casino now. His dad is retired, so he's an even bigger deal. And he threatens to kick her out because of the age and the law. You gotta follow the law in books like this. And she's like, no, they'll kill my dad. And he's like, okay, fine. If you get dinner with me, I'll give you 10 minutes. As if that amount of time should be at all meaningful for her quest. But she's like, thank you so much. And she goes back to the table. Continues winning, obviously. And somehow for her last hand and like the last minute of her allowance inside of this casino, the pot is just magically at 16 grand, where before it was much lower and she wins. All of the men compliment her because she apparently has no tell, she's unbeatable. Nobody knows what she's thinking, but little do they know it's because she has never had a single thought in her life. But she's unbelievable. She's the best there's ever been. I can die tonight and feel I've played a truly worthy opponent, kiddo. It's been a pleasure, Abby. Very enlightened for a guy who just lost thousands of dollars, but whatever. After all of this, she still does not have enough money. She is at approximately $20,000, which really does not make a lot of sense given the fact that she apparently did have $11,000 dollars that she got from betting on prize fights all semester unless that entire $16,000 pot was her which would not make a lot of sense it really feels like she did not make a proportionate amount of money from that poker game but these are logical questions and problems I have with this book that will never go anywhere so I don't even know why I'm bringing them up anyways she does not have enough money she's short about five grand so she's panicking because apparently the money is due that day Shepley is like well I won $300 in slots that you can add in will that help and Abby is like my father is dying in front of my eyes and at this point Travis finds out about the dinner with Jesse and is incredibly angry, but bravely stays silent given the circumstances with the dying father. And collectively, they decide that the best course of action is just to go and talk to the mob and try to reason with them and see what's up, just for fun, without all of the money. Let's go negotiate. What could possibly go wrong? They're only threatening murder. We meet outside of the headquarters of the mob. What I am pretty sure is the only black person in this entire book. It wasn't a surprise to see the enormous doorman. Black, frightening, and as wide as he was tall. Who is described as you have seen to be shaped like a very threatening square. And Abby and Travis go in together to talk to Benny. Mick owes me 25,000. I trust you have the full amount, Benny said, scribbling something on a notepad. Actually, I paused, clearing my throat. I'm 5K short, Benny. But I have all day tomorrow to get that. And 5,000 is no problem, right? You know I'm good for it. Abigail, Benny said, frowning. You disappoint me. You know my rules better than that. At this point, two scary men step out of the shadows of Benny's office. And Benny is like, yeah, sorry, I guess we have to beat you up and maybe kill you as well just, you know, to teach your useless father a lesson. Just not the way you want this interaction to go. But lest you forget in the wake of this entire book, it's been like 200 pages since our last college basement prize fight, Travis is undefeated. He's got that mad dog in him and he stands up, he pulls Abby to safety and he goes, I hope you know, Benny, that when I take out your men, I mean no disrespect, but I'm in love with this girl and I can't let you hurt her. 
Benny burst into a loud cackle. I gotta hand it to you, son. You've got the biggest balls of anyone that's come through those doors. I'll prepare you for what you're about to get. The rather large fella to your right is David, and if he can't take you out with his fists, he's going to use that knife in his holster. The man to your left is Dane, and he's my best fighter. He's got a fight tomorrow, as a matter of fact, and he's never lost. Mind you don't hurt your hands, Dane. I've got a lot of money riding on you. Abby sees this, she's worried, she's like, no, stop, don't hurt him. Completely forgetting that Travis getting beaten up by his older brothers for 18 years has prepared him to fight multiple trained gangsters at once. But they actually choose not to fight him at the same time for some reason, they just go in one by one for dramatic effect and then both get stunted on. Surprising nobody, Travis goes maybe too hard, he starts smashing Dane's face over and over again into a desk while Benny just claps and laughs. Ha ha ha, so cool. After this, after Travis is done destroying these idiots, Benny is like, yeah, so I have an idea on how to clear your debt because you did just put my best guy into the hospital or maybe into his grave, it's really unclear. But if you fight in his place instead tomorrow, then I'll just forgive the rest of Mick's debt. You'll be fighting Brock McMahon. He's no wallflower. He was barred from the UFC last year. Travis was unaffected. Just tell me where I need to be. They leave and we also get some really cool pros here when Travis is like, we all do hard things sometimes. I had seen it before. For. Vegas changed people, creating monsters and broken men. It was easy to let the lights and stolen dreams seep into your blood. I had seen the energized, invincible look on Travis's face many times growing up, and the only cure was a plane ride home. The next day, we get quite literally one page of the dinner between Abby and Jesse. He's like, stay with me, this is a sign that I saw you, and she's like, sorry, no, I have to go watch my loving boyfriend beat somebody near to death live on stage. Off I go to do that, and then she just leaves in the middle of dinner and goes to watch Travis's fight. Travis ends up winning this fight that happens. There's like a criminal lack of description of it, we don't really get any details, which especially sucks because apparently he even got hit by this man. Many people would have told you that it couldn't be done, but apparently it can. But whatever, he still takes the fight, so Mick's debt is now cleared with Benny. We will never see this man again in this book. It's completely unknown what happens to him. I imagine that he was milked for some more plot points in future books, but that's neither here or there. It's none of my business. And the two of them celebrate saving her useless father's life by almost hooking up in public until Travis thinks it's the right time to mention that he's just received the offer of a lifetime. I'm going to make enough money to replace what Mick took from you, to pay for the rest of your tuition, pay off my bike, and buy you a new car. And that's just the beginning. And how exactly are you going to do that? Benny's going to let me fight here in Vegas. Six figures of fight, Pidge. Six figures of fight. Obviously, Abby is not a fan of this offer, which rare situation in this book where I kind of do see both sides here. Because on one hand, you have someone who grew up in poverty who sees the opportunity to create some generational wealth for both himself and the people that he loves using the skills that he was forced to pick up through his life. It makes sense why he is probably not thinking this through all of the way. That's a truly imaginary amount of money. And Abby's compelling point, which is also real, is yeah, but it's through the mob, and they can just decide to kill you whenever you stop providing value to them. And also, either way, you'll still be beholden to the mob, which is just not a great entity to be beholden to. They argue about it. Abby hits him with this zinger. What about your criminal justice degree? You're going to be seeing your old classmates quite a bit working for Benny, I promise you. Pew! Pew! Got him once again, Abby. Abby continues to make some good points, like what if it's really hard to leave? What if you suddenly become expendable? Etc. Etc. Valid questions. And Travis just hits her with the, yeah, but I will be doing it anyways because they're paying me a lot of money and also because I definitely know what's best for us, even though you are the one who was literally raised in the basement of a Vegas casino. I just really think I'm in the right here. I have all of the knowledge that I need. You're not doing this for me. Stop pretending you are. He leaned over, kissing my hair. No, I'm doing it for us. You just can't see how great it's going to be. Then he changes the subject to how he wants her to come over and cook for his family on Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's right. She's going to come over and cook for somebody else's family because normally I guess they just do pizza, but because she has a surplus of estrogen inside of her body, she knows how to cook a turkey, unlike any of these stinky men. But she agrees to this kind of dead inside from the earlier conversation. But this problem does not die. They keep arguing on the plane all the way home and then ultimately in front of their dog, they end up breaking up because Travis is just refusing to even consider that Abby might not want to be involved in this situation. Why did you even ask me, Travis? You were going to work for Benny no matter what I said. I want your support on this, but it's too much money to turn down. I would be crazy to say no. I sat for a moment, stunned. Once it had all sunk in, I nodded. Okay then, you've made your decision. 
Travis beamed. You'll see, Pigeon. It's going to be great. He pushed off the bed, walked over to me, and kissed my fingers. I'm starved. Are you hungry? Just completely unaware that there could even possibly be problems with this behavior. But at this point, Abby is over it. She decides to leave. She enlists Samerica to drive her back to her dorm. She, like, lies to him as if they're not breaking up because her ability to handle conflict is completely non-existent. I don't really know what her plan is here, but it doesn't really matter because her facade cracks and she starts crying. And Travis realizes when she's in the car that she's actually leaving for good. And the girls know that he knows which dorm room number is Abby's, so America graciously offers to let Abby sleep in her room with her mysterious roommate, Vanessa. Never before seen, we will not be meeting her, but she does exist, apparently. Which, in actuality, means that hours later, it is poor f***ing Kara who has to deal with Travis pounding on the door, when all this woman wants to do is go to bed. Once again, in Abby's brain, Kara does not deserve rights. She does not deserve unconditional positive regard. Down the hall, Travis pounded on my door, calling my name. Pidge, open the f***ing door, damn it. I'm not leaving until you talk to me. Pigeon, he yelled, banging on the door so loudly the entire building could have heard. I cringed when I heard Kara's mousy voice. What? She growled. I pressed my ear against the door, struggling to hear Travis's low murmurs. I didn't have to strain for long. I know she's here, he yelled. Pigeon? She's not- Hey! Kara squealed. The door cracked against the cement block wall of her room, and I knew that Travis had forced his way in. A cautionary tale to college freshmen who are considering grooming random. The crazy roommates in your life will believe that they're the protagonists of books like this, that they're living such notable and interesting lives, but much like the actual protagonists of books like this, they are still f***ing insufferable. I hate her. After this interaction, Travis apparently just sits in the hallway with his head in his hands like this all night, and Abby skips all of her classes, which, by the way, why is she even going to class at this point. It's like a side quest for her. She's not even studying anything specific. She's in college for the vibes in the cafeteria alone, but whatever. America calls her to update her the next day. He was kicked out of history today. When you didn't show, he kicked over both of your desks. Shep heard that he waited for you after all your classes. He's losing it, Abby. I told him you were done the second he made the decision to work for Benny. Do you remember, America? Do you remember when he ransacked your boyfriend's entire apartment and your takeaway from that was, wow, what an awesome and wonderful man who was done so dirty by my best friend. Do you remember that? Do you remember when that was your entire worldview? A week passes of this and Abby just continues skipping all of their shared classes and then leaving the rest of them early all of the time so that way he can't catch her. I don't really know how that works, but finally she decides to make an appearance at the cafeteria of communion and Travis finds her and they talk and it turns out that he has officially said no to Benny with the offer. And he's like, see, see, I did what you wanted. And now in return, I request relationship. It's just equivalent exchange. Say you forgive me, say you'll take me back. I can't. Travis's face crumpled. I took the opportunity to walk around him, but he sidestepped to stand in my way. I haven't slept or ate. I can't concentrate. I know you love me. Everything will be the way it used to be if you just take me back. I closed my eyes. We are dysfunctional, Travis. I think you're just obsessed with the thought of owning me more than anything else. A truly astute observation coming from the girl who he tattooed onto his wrist after only one week of dating. But at this point, regardless of all of the nonsense that he's saying, she still stands strong, which is nice. She's like, I'm done with you. Go home. And he goes, you're my home. Okay. Cool. And then he pulls her into him and kisses her without her consent because Travis likes considering all of the available options for behavior at any time and then choosing for fun the absolute worst one. Abby does not kiss back. Obviously, I mean, she wants to dump him and eventually he has the grace to let go and she leaves. She scampers away and she cries in the bathroom and Finch ends up coming in to comfort her and she's like, how did you know I was in here? Kara saw you come in and came out to the dorms to get me. Actually, the most benevolent person that I've ever met in my life to be this nice considering that her roommate hates her and treats her like a piece of gum on the bottom of her shoes, just putting her through a torrential downpour of bullshit. I am a Kara supporter inside of this book. She's a better person than me. But Abby goes home, she cries, she goes to bed, and the next day, Parker sits next to her in class, and he goes, just because we're not dating anymore doesn't mean you can't wear the bracelet I bought you. Demonstrating he still preserved his audacity, despite what he's been put through inside of this book. He also apologizes here for spreading rumors that she was calling him when she wasn't. It seems kind of genuine, but that was still a wild thing to do. And Abby tells him that she doesn't want to date him, but Parker's like, that's fine, we can just be friends. So I guess they're friends now? Great. At this point, it's Thanksgiving break, and Abby is now planning on spending it with America's family, despite the fact that America's evil, and her family sold her out to her useless father. But Travis stops her outside of class and is like, hey, so I heard you were going to Kansas, but uh, 
turns out that I never told my family that we broke up. And it turns out that I still need you to be my date so that way you can cook for us. Is that okay? It, you said you would come. And Abby lets this slide far too easily. Travis is all like, the whole family is never in town for the holidays, but they're all coming into town for you as if they're not just all together for random f***ing poker nights throughout the year like we literally saw earlier in this book. But Travis ends up saying, look, after Thanksgiving, I'll tell them that we broke up. And somehow this is enough for her. This below minimum, like bar is in the pits of Tartarus type offer. She's like, yep, that works for me. And so she goes. Travis ends up picking her up 12 hours early on the eve of Thanksgiving. So that way she has to spend the night, which is an insane thing to do. But I guess maybe is a miscommunication. And like the first line out of this man's mouth is, I still love you, Pidge. <laughs> and she's like, oh, yep, mm, they go. Abby gets set up in the guest room and Travis agrees to sleep on the floor. We'll see how that goes. And Abby starts preparing all of the food for tomorrow. Travis kind of nominally helps her by peeling some potatoes, but then he just leaves to play cards just while Abby continues to cook for everybody and also do the dishes by herself. How awesome. What a way to spend Thanksgiving with your insane ex-boyfriend, his entire family as his maid. Travis's dad, whose name is Jim, by the way, I'm not sure if I've actually said that in this video. Jim catches on to Travis and Abby having a rancid vibe, but he doesn't know why. So he just gives her kind of a generic inspirational speech. I know it's hard not to blame him, but you have to love him anyway, Abby. You're the only woman he's loved besides his mother. I don't know what it'll do to him if you leave him too. I've never seen him smile the way he does when he's with you. I hope all my boys have an Abby one day. And then Mike drops, he just leaves the room before Abby can meaningfully respond and she just continues doing the dishes while trying not to cry. Also, I just want to mention that every other sentence in this section is some kind of description of how shitty this man's house is. It's just Abby looking at the peeling wallpaper, Abby staring into the gross brown carpet, Abby scrubbing away her sins in the dilapidated shower while focusing on the water stains to help her dissociate. The house might as well be abandoned. Like all that's inside of it is testosterone, chores for Abby, and framed pictures of every poker player known to mankind. Eventually Abby and Travis go to bed and Travis tries hitting her with the, I love you and you loved me once, right? Didn't you? <laughs> right? <laughs> Cause if you did, maybe you could possibly let me hold you tonight so I don't have to sleep on the cold floor on my own. Yeah, you saw this coming a mile away. Like there was a 0% chance that that man was going to make it through the entire night on the dilapidated, awful, rotted, hardwood floors. But shockingly, they don't actually hook up until the next morning. So that's kind of restraint, you know? It's cursed. The relationship still seems to be clearly over. Like they're both being very delusional. Abby kind of just decides inside of her head that she's going to pretend to be dating him again, but just for today, just for fun, just to see where that takes her psyche. What a good idea this is for both of them, said no one ever. Travis being manipulative in this pathetic of a way somehow got him dividends that he did not deserve. But Abby ends up cooking this family three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's wonderful. I mean, everybody absolutely loves her for good reason. And at this point, she's become so enamored with the idea of becoming a part of this mostly unbroken home that she's like, you know what? Maybe I will take Travis back. Like, not as pretend. Maybe he is the perfect man. Resolve is gone. Resolve is missing in action. But at the end of Thanksgiving, she's having the same circular conversation with him, hoping that he'll ask for the five millionth time to be with her again, so that way she can actually say yes this time. Abby, by the way, is incapable of bringing this up on her own. It's not in her nature. But instead, this time, he finally goes, you said you're done with me and I accept that. I'm a different person since I met you. I've changed for the better. But no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to do right by you. We were friends first and I can't lose you, Pigeon. I will always love you. But if I can't make you happy, it doesn't make much sense for me to try to get you back. I can't imagine being with anyone else, but I'll be happy as long as we're friends. And Abby does that thing that I feel like men do sometimes, where if you send them a really long message, they will only read and reply to the very last sentence. Like everything else may as well not exist. Because Abby hears this entire monologue and her takeaway is, oh, you wanna be friends? And inside she's thinking to herself, wow, he's completely over me. I thought he wanted to be with me, but I guess that he just wanted closure. Does she talk about these feelings? Does she even consider broaching this subject? No, she just lets it happen and then goes home and feels sad for literally no reason. Like to her detriment, this man is obsessed with her. If she dates somebody else, they will probably end up mysteriously dead in a ditch. And she's still thinking to herself, well, I guess he just doesn't like me. Like, what do you mean? Next, we get a slick fast forward into finals week and we don't know what classes Abby is taking or what she's doing with her life, but apparently she kills it. She gets A's in everything and then signs up for more mystery classes in the spring. And she comes back to campus after break, ready to start anew. She's moved on. She's in this new era of friendship with this man. We find out that there is another date party on Valentine's Day. America is being a baby about it again. She's like, I won't go without Abby. So in comes Finch back from the dead has been basically irrelevant to this entire book, but Finch is now Abby's date to this fraternity party. Despite the fact that neither of them are in this fraternity, I don't really 
really think that that is how that works, that they can just show up, but I guess anyone can go to this one. America and Abby go to Travis's to get something, and also because Abby remembers that she ostensibly has a small animal who is living with him. She hasn't seen Toto in months. She has no idea if he's alive or dead. But it just so happens that coincidence of the century, they get there, and who comes in but Travis and Megan, who are falling through the door while making out, apparently. She's giggling and looking especially like a I imagine, to Abby, and Travis is holding a box of condoms. The scene is damning, to say the least, although it is well within his rights as a single man, but they end up having the most senselessly dramatic conversation yet. I can't win with you. I can't win with you. You say you're done. I'm fucking miserable over here. I had to break my phone into a million pieces to keep from calling you every minute of the damn day. I've had to play it off like everything is just fine at school so you can be happy, and you're fucking mad at me? You broke my fucking heart. Do you want me or not? You can't keep doing this to me, Pidge. <laughs> just the fact that in the heat of the moment, every single time he's still calling her some variation of pigeon is astonishing to me. I didn't come here to see you, I said, glaring up at him. I don't want her, he said, staring at my lips. I'm just so fucking unhappy, pigeon. His eyes glossed over and he leaned in, tilting his head to kiss me. What do you mean, tilting his head to kiss me? Where am I? I grabbed him by the chin, holding him back. You've got her lipstick on your mouth, Travis, I said, disgusted. Once again, scoring a zero on being honest about her feelings, Abby has the emotional range of like a piece of plywood. You know you're doing something terribly wrong when a man like Travis actually kind of has a point. It is so ridiculous for her to break up with him and then be mad that he's hooking up with somebody else after a couple of months instead of just writhing in agony 24-7. And then after that, to refuse to actually talk about why you're clearly so mad. Like, to not say even one word about your feelings. Like, what do you want from him? But at this point, Abby takes a step towards the car, and Travis grabs her arm, which is the first real thing in this entire book to push America into actually trying to defend her friend. In the next moment, America was wildly hitting his arm with her fists. He looked at her, blinking for a moment in stunned disbelief. She balled up her fists and pounded them against his chest until he released me. Leave her alone, you bastard! <laughs> Shepley ends up pulling her off of him. Abby broke up with him. He's just trying to move on. And America responds by saying, Well then, why don't you find a random whore, she looked at Megan, from the red and bring her home to f and then let me know if it helps you get over me. And she dumps him, which is, lest you have forgotten, his absolute nightmare scenario. This has been keeping Shepley up at night for the last six months. Even though this time it's especially ridiculous. Like, if America was going to do this, if she was going to choose sides, you'd think that she would have done so long, long ago. But after this, we get another time skip a couple of weeks into the beginning of February, and we get this insane scene where Abby and America go clubbing, and they start grinding on random dudes, you know, just living that single life. But then the dudes just keep disappearing, and then new ones will appear afterwards, and then the new ones will disappear as well, and the circle continues. But they're not facing the guys, so they don't really know what's happening, until they happen to see that Travis and Shepley are just yanking these men away by their collars, and then threatening them on the side of the dance floor. Just every single man who dares to get within range of the girl and they argue with their respective exes. Abby tells Travis that they will never be able to be friends. Shepley and America go to fight inside of a booth, but then five minutes later, they're making out again, and they're back together. This breakup lasted like two pages, and because they're back together, now everybody can still go to the Valentine's Day frat party. Yay! Some more time passes, and America has apparently ghosted Abby entirely to hang out with Shepley since they're back together again. This should not surprise you, she is definitely the type, and in Abby's moment of weakness, Parker appears. Just once more into the breach, he can't get enough of her. He shows up outside of one of her classes and he's like, hey, so you mentioned that cool movie you wanted to see and so I got us tickets, just the two of us, for tonight if you want to go. Just us two and I'm paying for it, but it says friends, you know, just because we're the best of friends, we should totally go. And Plywood Abby agrees to this. She's like, yeah, just me and my best friend Parker going to dinner and a movie right before Valentine's Day. There's clearly no secret ulterior motive here. It'll be a great time. And they go out to this diner and they're about to order when Travis and Shepley walk in. And Travis goes straight up to her and he's like, hey, so I have a fight in 45 minutes. I need you there. It's a rematch with Brady Hoffman, the guy from State. It's a big crowd, lots of money floating around, and Adam says Brady's been training. You've fought him before, Travis. You know it's an easy win. Abby, Parker said quietly. I need you there, Travis said. I looked at Parker with an apologetic smile. I'm sorry. And she just ditches him to go to this fight. Like, Travis grabs her hand and they run away. But that's the end of Parker's arc. We don't really ever see him again after this. He lived and died to be a cuck yet again, even when he thought he was finally safe. Like, this man is on the dark parts of Reddit now. Abby and Travis get to the fight and Travis plants a kiss on her, which she's into this time, and he goes, that's all the luck I need. Okay, cool. And it turns out that this Brady guy that he's fighting is actually somewhat competent now. He's able to land a hit on Travis, but you know this to be true. Nobody does it like Dylan Sprouse. Spoilers, he wins yet
it again like he does every single fight in this entire book but he has like blood on his teeth now when he wins so he looks particularly edgy and Abby somehow gets pushed through the crowd until she magically just has her back against the wall of this basement and Ethan from 200 pages ago is in front of her do you remember him Ethan the man who seems normal at the time except apparently he has assault charges so he's evil and it's okay for Travis to beat him up if he wants to and you know what I think he does deserve what's coming for him honestly because I don't know what he expects given the fact that he chooses now in a dirty college basement where he just watched Travis beat the sh out of some guy who is much more jacked than Ethan probably is he just watched that and he's like yeah this is a great opportunity to sexually harass that guy's girlfriend Ethan doesn't even go here he has no way of knowing that they broke up so honestly he's really just reaping what he sows because obviously Travis finds him and he's described as literally punching people in the crowd until they get out of his way but it is taking him a couple of seconds to punch his way through that many civilians since there's a referee that's trying to stop him from doing this so it's actually Shepley of all people who ends up getting to them and taking Ethan off of her first in the next moment I was free Shepley's eyes were wild staring into Ethan's as he gripped him by the collar of his shirt he held Ethan against the wall while he nailed him with his fist repeatedly in the face stopping only when the blood poured from Ethan's mouth and nose I'll be honest with you I didn't really know he had that in him they end up filtering outside and keep in mind it's like dinner time still that's when this fight is happening and in the courtyard of this on-campus school building Travis ends up finding that referee who was trying to hold him back from punching civilians on his way to protect Abby a small crowd gathered around them as they scuffled on the ground Travis pounded his fist into the man's face over and over Shepley pulled me into his chest still panting the man stopped fighting back and Travis left him on the ground in a bloody heap those gathered around him fanned out giving Travis a wide berth seeing the rage in his eyes that guy was just some dude who was probably just trying to follow the rules but whatever Travis does eventually find Ethan Ethan pleaded with Travis even as Travis gripped his shirt and rammed his head into the car door the begging was cut off with the loud thud of his skull against the windshield and then Travis pulled him to the front of the car and shattered the headlight with Ethan's face Travis launched him onto the hood pressing his face into the metal while shouting obscenities dead dead right like, he seems dead I don't know for sure like we never find out for the first time ever the cops are actually called into this situation and they show up so Travis just leaves Ethan's limp body on the hood of this random car and then runs away nobody by the way will ever be convicted of anything Travis will never be questioned in relation to all of these mysterious people that are just beaten up not only in college basements but also apparently in the cold light of day the circle doesn't even get busted like the cops are only at this scene for dramatic effect it's nothing more than that the four of them get back to the apartment and they all do a shot of whiskey in sync and then talk about their feelings and Travis expresses some regret for landing them in this situation it wouldn't have happened if I just let you stay with Parker but I knew if I asked you you'd come I wanted to show him that you were still mine and then you got hurt the words took me off guard as if I hadn't heard him right that's why you asked me to come tonight to prove a point to Parker it was part of it he said ashamed somehow this blows Abby's mind like I guess she just didn't expect this guy to be jealous and petty him he would never once again proving that her ability to comprehend and adapt to changes in her environment is startlingly small in retaliation she decides to throw a glass at his head and it shatters against the wall after he dodges it matrix style like he does these two people should not be in a relationship I don't know what kind of therapy they need but it's extensive and all we get instead out of this is Abby leaves she cries a bit she sleeps and then she has this realization all along I believed that I was important to Travis that he needed me but in that moment I felt like the shiny new toy Parker said I was he wanted to prove to Parker that I was still his his I'm nobody's I said to the empty room as the words sunk in I was overwhelmed with the grief I'd felt from the night before I belonged to no one I'd never felt so alone in my life yes because every girl's dream is to belong to a man so true we get another time skip to the Valentine's Day party that she's at now with Finch remember Finch you don't really have to because he doesn't do anything inside of this chapter that's of value and Travis shows up stag obviously you knew he was going to and he does a bunch of annoying things but the worst ones begin when he starts threatening the person who asked Abby to dance if you you don't back away from my girl I'll rip out your f***ing throat right here on the dance floor Brad seems conflicted his eyes nervously darting from me to Travis sorry Abby he said slowly pulling his arms away he retreated to the stairs and I stood alone humiliated how I feel about you right now Travis it very closely resembles hate dance with me he pleaded swaying to keep his balance instead of dancing with Travis and rewarding him for this behavior she just decides to go grind on some other random guy and then Travis comes in and he just picks her up she's very small and lady and short remember he throws her over his shoulder and he takes her outside so that way she can't dance with anyone anymore put me down I said pounding my fists into his back I'm not going to let you embarrass yourself over me he growled taking the stairs two at a time as if what is happening is not 10,000 times worse for her reputation but whatever he carries her outside and he puts her into 
the car of the person who is the DD for the event and he goes, I need you to take us to my apartment. Travis, I don't think, Travis's voice was controlled but frightening. Do it, Donnie, or I'll shove my fist through the back of your head, I swear to God. Just kidnapping at this point. We've evolved into kidnapping, very cool. And you really might think that all of these threats of gratuitous violence, or maybe the startling loss of agency that Abby has recently experienced, maybe how drunk Travis is this entire time, like you'd really think that all of these things would make her not want to see this man again, right? Right? You can't tell me what to do anymore, Travis. I don't belong to you. In the second it took him to turn and face me, his expression had contorted into anger. He stomped toward me, planting his hands on the bed and leaning into my face. Well, I belong to you! The veins in his neck bulged as he shouted, and I met his glare, refusing to even flinch. He looked at my lips, panting. I belong to you he whispered, his anger melting as he realized how close we were. Okay, yeah, shouting in her face, like surely that's the last straw, right? She's gonna tell him to leave. I mean, she could just report him to the police for any of his many crimes that he just commits on a regular basis. Like there are ways for her to get out of this. And I mean, at this point, she's probably done, right? Right? Before I could think of a reason not to, I grabbed his face, slamming my lips against his. Without hesitation, Travis lifted me into his arms. In a few long strides, he carried me into his bedroom, both of us crashing to the bed. Right? I've been yours since the second we met. My voice took the tone of begging. Any other time I would have been embarrassed, but I was beyond regret. I had fought my feelings, guarded them, and bottled them up. I had experienced the happiest moments of my life while at Eastern, all of them with Travis. Fighting, laughing, loving, or crying. If it was with him, it was where I wanted to be. Yeah, Abby's favorite pastime is making terrible decisions, so they get back together, and I think you know how it goes by now, because the only thing that's different is that the next day when Abby wakes up, it turns out that Travis never slept. He's just been watching her for nine hours. His eyes are red and bloodshot. And he did this because he was so terrified that she would leave again. Just the level of security that you want from the woman that you have tattooed on your body. But Abby just sees this as like a quirky little happenstance between the two of them. She reassures him that no, like she's in it now. Our relationship will last until the end of time. And this time it's actually true. They don't break up again after this. You would think that this book would be settled, but whereas other beta romance novels have a 90% conflict that revolves around miscommunication, Alpha, beautiful disaster is like we've had enough of that throughout the entire rest of the book so how about instead we just sprinkle in a little bit of arson about one month after the date party and into the bliss of coupledom, Travis is waiting on the information for the last fight of the semester, which is happening right before spring break and also apparently is going to be paying him enough money to pay rent for the next eight months if he wins. So kind of a big deal, but Travis doesn't trust Shepley anymore to protect Abby after Ethan Gate, so he decides to enlist his older brother Trent to protect her this time. Zero meaningful notice, by the way, to this guy. Travis essentially calls him up and is like, hey, can you just be free for the next week? You're just gonna need to appear wherever I need you within an hour of me telling you where to go. Nothing more than that in terms of details, but who needs it? Not Trent, apparently. He doesn't appear to have very much of a life. And the night of the fight finally comes, and it's taking place in like the most dilapidated and old building on campus. And they go into it through this weird shortcut that's just a window on the ground floor or the basement. I mean, I have no idea how other people are getting into this building because they're the only ones who are doing it this way, but whatever. They get in, they go to the fight, and this is apparently the closest one yet. It's against this guy named John Savage, and I guess if you have a name like that, then you must be a real competitor. So this is a close one. It's the first truly close one that this book has really had, but it doesn't matter. Travis still wins because in this book, he never loses a single fucking time. He's just the best to ever do it. I told you it from the beginning, but the room that they're in is kind of sketchy. Like, yes, this is an academic building. This is a college campus, but apparently the room is just lit up by a ton of different hanging lanterns. And these lanterns have actual fire just for the ambiance. I don't know what this room is used for during the daytime, but as Travis is being called the winner of this fight, as he's smiling, his edgy, bloody smile, as the people in the room are celebrating winning their bets or whatever with the circle. Abby notices out of the corner of her eye that one of those lanterns looks incredibly unstable. It's like leaking a ton of gasoline. It's just looking not great. And then on cue, the lantern, whatever is holding it up, just like breaks spontaneously and the lantern falls to the ground and sets the entire building on fire. And I just want to say, it's a complete mystery what's going on here. I don't know if this is some kind of freak accident, if that room really is just meant to be like lantern lit in this universe. And maybe 
maybe there was just some wear and tear on the chains or whatever was holding up the lanterns or if it was actually foul play like it kind of looks like it was and somebody set up the lantern to fall like we're never gonna know why would we want to find out even one of the essential mysteries inside of this book but regardless at this point everything is on fire and i don't know how this building is supposed to be set up but apparently it's a maze and nobody can remember how to get out of the building part of it is definitely the panic of there just being a large amount of people but most of it seems to be that nobody knows where the f they're going which is crazy like how did they all get in there the fire is not cutting off any exits it's starting in the corner of the basement like just leave abby of course is one of those people who can't remember how to get out somehow also i guess this building has no signs despite the fact that every building i was ever in in college had exit signs everywhere this one just doesn't so abby and trent just start moving in a direction with the crowd and they are completely separated from travis at this point he is not in sight and all of those other lanterns that were also lighting the room they're all now exploding just to add to the drama and abby starts to think that maybe she does know where to go to get to her little window that they got into the building with but clearly she doesn't she's just with trent running through these dark hallways and listening to the screams of people who are dying in this fire because that is actually happening like countless people are losing their lives somehow smoke starts to fill up all of the airspace inside of this hallway and they run into these five people whose faces are stained with soot to show that they've been struggling and these people are like there are windows this way that we can use to get out and abby's like no they're not that way and she just runs away in the other direction and trent kind of tries to follow her but loses her so he just turns around and goes with these other people so he doesn't die but somehow through some miracle she's able to find the original room that she came in except unfortunate because she's too small and frail and lady she actually can't reach the window and when she moves around some furniture so that way she finally can she ends up being too weak to open it up on her own so she's just trapped in there now reaping facing the consequences of her actions and she opens up the door to the hallway to check out the situation and there is fire now that is barreling down the hallway just burning up these sheets that are on all of the walls so that way it's covering kind of three-dimensionally so by all counts this woman should be screwed she should be absolutely decimated just out of sheer stupidity for not using the front door like everybody else but in the 11th hour in her time of dying who comes out of the woodwork who comes to save her but dylan sprouse a faint cough sputtered behind me <coughs> pigeon? I flipped around to the familiar voice. Travis appeared in a doorway behind me, his face and clothes covered in soot. And because Travis is so tall and strong and man, he's able to break the window and get them out of the building just in time right before they die. Now, I know what you're wondering, and let me give you an important piece of context. Travis had no idea whether or not Abby had already made it out safe. It's not like he got outside and realized that she was not there and then went back in, okay? This was all completely blind. And with that, I know what you're wondering, okay? You're wondering, why was Travis there? Why would he risk killing himself before leaving the building on the impulse that maybe Abby Abby would be dumb enough to not be able to find a single exit. Just on the off chance that she ended up trapped inside of this room and didn't think for herself to use anything inside of it to break the window. And even if she was in that room, A, you could go there from the outside of the building, but B, she was there way after she should have been. She should have found that room way sooner than she did. And he could have gone there and just propped up the window and waited outside. So why is he wading through fire for no reason? He doesn't know she's still in there. Obviously it all works out, but in my book, both of them deserve to die. This was absolutely ridiculous, but whatever. He punches through the window with his fist. They survive, and now they're waiting outside and looking around for Trent, Travis's brother, who has mysteriously disappeared. And this man is nowhere to be seen. They're described as waiting outside for two hours for him to show up. And Travis is becoming increasingly concerned because, again, many people have apparently died in this. Like, the firemen are bringing out dozens of bodies that are unrecognizable from the wreckage. Like, so many things had to go wrong for this scene to happen at all. It's just such an unrecognizable place for this book to end. Anyways, reading this, worried about what happened to Trent, you're like, wow, maybe this book really did have stakes. If this man dies, that's one less book that this author can milk out of this extended universe. But it turns out, no. Instantly, in the next chapter, we learn that Trent is still alive. It was a false twist. And I guess his phone died or something. And then he left before knowing for sure that Travis and Abby were alive to go charge it. But then it took two hours. I don't know. But for whatever reason, somehow it took him this long to contact Travis. Just really two for two on absolute <laughs> idiots inside of this family. It's homegrown. Grown, I guess. But Travis and Abby go back to his apartment and they have one last tearful conversation about how the trauma of the sudden fire slash possible arson nobody knows of this building showed both of them that they would rather be dead than be without each other. It's us, Trav. Nothing makes sense unless we're together. Have you noticed that? Noticed? I've been telling you that all year, he teased. It's official. Bimbos, fights, leaving, Parker, Vegas, even fires. Our relationship can withstand anything. And Abby's like, so true. And also, speaking of Vegas, I've just decided 
admitted that I want to be married to you at 19. Marry me, I said without hesitation. I was surprised at how quickly and easily the words came. His mouth spread into a broad smile. When? I shrugged. We can book a flight tomorrow. It's spring break. I don't have anything going on tomorrow, do you? I felt like I was having a stroke reading this, considering the fact that Abby was getting kidnapped 20 pages ago and now they're getting married. Like, cool, awesome. And the best part of this is Abby is like, yeah, you know, we can worry about rings later. And Travis is like, well, actually. I looked down as he placed the small velvet square on his chest, reaching behind him to rest his head on his arm. What's that? I asked. What does it look like? Okay, let me rephrase the question. When did you get that? Travis inhaled, and as he did, the box rose with his chest and fell when he pushed the air from his lungs. A while ago. You cannot tell me that Travis did not already have the ring when he was drunkenly rambling about how happy he was to have gotten the wrist tattoo. Actually, wild stuff, but at this point, it's just cute. Abby's like, aw, babe, because they're together forever now, and it's a happily ever after. Good for them. One last time skip in the epilogue, and it's like two days later, but big difference because they're f***ing married now. They did it. They are wed. Yes. Awesome. But so much worse than that, like, sincerely, several factors of ten deeper into the trenches. Abby is at a tattoo parlor, taking a call from America, who just found out that Abby is now married. I'm going to kill you, Abby Abernathy, America cried. Kill you! Technically, it's Abby Maddox now. And America's mad, by the way, not because this is an insane thing to do, to marry your on-again, off-again boyfriend of approximately six months, except only two of those months were actually together, and to make that decision after experiencing a mutually traumatic event. America is not sitting here like, hey, maybe we should take a step back and, like, consider how events in our lives might impact our feelings in ways that aren't permanent, and maybe we shouldn't always make rash, terrible decisions because of them. That's not why she's freaking out. She's freaking out because she's always imagined being able to do more women be shopping with Abby for her wedding, and her rights as best friend in such a situation evaporated once Abby decided to elope. But that's their thing. That's what they do together. That's the cornerstone of their relationship. It's how this book perceives female friendship. You're either a hoe, an enemy, or you're a woman I shop with who helps me make bad decisions. But anyways, during this call, the tattoo finishes, and we find out what Abby chose to get. I looked down at the beautiful black lines on my red and angry skin. Mrs. Maddox. Wow, I said, rising up on my elbows to get a better look. Travis's frown instantly turned into a triumphant smile. It's beautiful. Where's the tattoo? By the way, it's on her stomach. I get the impression that it's like right below her belly button because apparently her jeans are chafing it on her way out. Like just imagine seeing this on somebody in the wild. You're at the beach, it's the summer, the salt air is crisp, and you turn to your right just enjoying the day and you see Dylan Sprouse with a woman who has Mrs. Maddox tattooed right below her belly button in like freestyle script, retro off of Microsoft Word. It is the worst possible tattoo in the worst possible place. And she's so excited about it in this chapter. She's like, that's my husband. That's the man who owns me. The two of them, after this, they go from the tattoo parlor to the airport. And he ends up having one more anxious moment where he's like, but what if you leave me? And she's like, dude, I literally just got your last name tattooed in the most embarrassing place to have an ex-husband's last name tattooed. I think you're probably safe. And he's like, so true. And that's it. That's the end of the book. All of their problems are solved. All of their demons have been defeated. There are no more possible obstacles in their relationship, clearly. I mean, I'm sure the more are invented in the other books, but that's none of my business. And it's perfect forever now. It's just wonderful for them. Wow. And that's it. That's the end of the road for this video. I would like to thank Sarah and friends for alerting me to this absolute masterpiece. And I hope that it's obvious why I really did feel like this book was a strangely earnest prototype of every single cliche that I've ever seen in my life. Just all of them were thrown into this book like sprinkles. It's truly insane. Obvious PSA, if a man treats you like this, he's no good. You should probably leave him. But less obvious PSA, if somebody treats you like Abby did? <laughs> oh, also leave them. They should leave each other. Neither of them deserve this, and yet both of them deserve this, so I guess whatever. Good for them. But yeah, that's it. Thank you to everybody for all of your patience regarding this video. My life is currently kind of in shambles, but I am picking up the pieces. I continue to fight on another day, and so do you. We're gonna get through this together. It's gonna be okay. But seriously, I really do appreciate you guys. I, to this day, cannot believe that so many people want to hear my opinions on things. Like, I do not feel like that is justified at all, but I do appreciate it so thank you. But if you like this video, as always, please leave an actual like. Please tell me every thought that you have in the comments. It really does help, and I do try to read as many as I possibly can, and I will be back with more sooner than I was the last time. I will not be gone for a month. Okay, I'm gonna go, like, lay down. <laughs> All right, bye!